Preface to Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated with the author's permission by Isabel Burton. Preface I cannot allow my readers to remain ignorant of the name of Senhor José de Alencar, the author of this and several other works, for he deserves to be as well known in England as in Brazil, and it must be the result of the usual modesty of a really clever man that he is not so. He is their first prose and romance writer. His style, written in the best Portuguese of the present day, one to be learned and copied, is in thorough good taste and feeling. It contains poetic and delicate touches, and beauty in similes, yet it is real and true to life. I cannot thank him sufficiently for having allowed so incompetent a translator as myself to be the first to introduce him to the British public. I have endeavored to be as literal as possible, but I cannot pretend to do him justice, for our harsh northern tongue only tells coarsely a tale full of grace and music in the Portuguese language. But I have done my best, and if he permits me to translate all his works, I hope to do better as I go on, especially, if he will again, as he has already done, give me instructions in Tupi, the language of the Aborigines. Isabel Burton, Santos, São Paulo, Brazil Historical Argument This legend of the Aborigines is laid in Ceará, a northern province of Brazil, at that time unknown and unconquered. In 1603, Pedro Coelho, a gentleman of Paraíba, another northerly province, then already belonging to the Portuguese, arrived at the mouth of the river Jaguaribi, in Ceará, with a command of eighty colonists and eight hundred Indians. He there founded the first settlement in Ceará, and called it Nova Lisboa. This Pedro Coelho was abandoned by his comrades when a certain João Soromenho was sent to him with reinforcements, and was authorized to pay the expenses of the expedition by making captives or slaves. He did not respect even the Indians of the Jaguaribi River, who were friendly to the Portuguese. This proved the downfall of the growing settlement. The natives resented such tyranny. Pedro Coelho, with his wife and young children, was compelled to fly by land to his own province. In the first expedition was Martin Soares Moreno, a youth from Rio Grande do Norte, another northerly province belonging to the Portuguese. He entered into bonds of friendship with Jacauna and his brother, Pochi, who were chiefs of the Indians of the seaboard. In 1608, by order of Dom Diogo Menezes, he returned to establish a colony, and in 1611, he founded the fortified place of Nossa Senhora do Amparo, or our Lady of Protection. Jacauna, who lived on the borders of Acaracu, river of the heron's nest, settled near it with his tribe to protect it from the Indians of the interior and from the French, who then infested the coast. Pochi eventually became a Christian and was baptized Antonio Felipe Camarão. He highly distinguished himself when the Dutch invaded the coast and his services were richly rewarded by the Portuguese government. Martin Soares Moreno became a field marshal and was one of those brave Portuguese leaders who delivered Brazil from the Hollander invasion. Ceará should honor his memory as that of a good and valiant man, and the first settlement by Coelho at the mouth of the Jaguaribi having proved a failure, hold him to be her true founder. My readers will better understand this tale by my explaining 
that the Pichiguaras were an aboriginal tribe who occupy the shores between Paraíba and the Jaguaribe, or Rio Grande. Their chiefs were Jacauna and Poti, afterwards Camarão, the Prawn, two brothers, who were firm allies to the Portuguese. They were at war with the Tabajaras, another tribe occupying the mountains of Ibiapaba, and the interior as far as the province of Piauí. The chiefs of these inland people were also two. The first was Irapuã, which translated into Portuguese means Mel Redondo, or Round Honey, a wild and vicious bee of that name. This famous, bloodthirsty chief ruled in Ceará, but Grão Diabo, Big Devil, was lord of the Tabajaras in Piauí. Both were bitter enemies of the Portuguese, and allied themselves with the French of Maranhão another northerly province, who had penetrated into and taken possession of the lands as far as the mountain range of Ibiapaba. End of preface. Chapter 1 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. Chapter 1 Wild green seas of my native land, where sings the Jandaya bird in the fronds of the Carnauba palm. Green seas, which sparkle like liquid emerald in the rays of the orient sun, as you stretch along the snowy beaches shaded by the cocoa tree. Be still, ye green seas, and gently smooth the impetuous wave, that yon venturesome bark may softly glide over thy waters. Where goes that hardy jangada raft, which rapidly flies from the Ceará coast, with her broad sail spread to the fresh breeze of land? Where goes it, like the white halcyon seeking his native rock in the ocean solitudes? Three beings breathe upon that fragile plank, which scuds so swiftly out, far into the open sea. A warrior youth, whose pale skin betokens that the blood of the Indians does not color his veins. A child, and a mastiff, who both first saw the light in the cradle of the forest, and who sport like brothers, the sons of the same savage soil. The intermittent breathings from the shore waft an echo which, rising high above the ripples of the waves, sounds forth Iracema. The young warrior, leaning against the mast, raises his eyes, which are fixed upon the fleeting outline of the shadowy shore. From time to time his sight becomes dim, and a tear falls upon the giral bench where frolic the two innocents, the companions of his misfortune. At such moments his soul flies to his lips in a bitter smile. What left he in that land of exile? A tale which they told me on the beautiful plains that saw my birth, during the hush of night, whilst the moon, sailing through the heavens, silvered the prairies. Whilst the breezes murmured amid the palm groves. The wind freshens. The surf rolls in higher billows. The bark leaps upon the waves, disappears on the horizon. Wide yawns the waste of waters. The storm broods, condor-like, with dusky wings over the abyss. God keep thee safe, stout bark, amidst the boiling billows. God steer thee to some friendly bide. May softer breezes waft thee, and for thee may the calm jasper seas be like plains of milk. But whilst thou sailest thus at the mercy of the wind's graceful bark, waft back to that white beach some of the yearning that accompanies thee, but which may not leave the land to which it returns. End of chapter 1
Chapter Two of Iracema. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. Chapter Two. Far, very far from that serra which purples the horizon, was born Iracema. Iracema, the Virgin with the Honey Lips, whose hair hanging below her palm-like waist, was jetty as the grauna bird's wing. The calm of the jati bee was less sweet than her smile, and her breath excelled the perfume exhaled by the vanilla of the woods. Fleeter than the wild row, the dark virgin wandered freely through the plains and forests of Ipu, where her warlike tribe, a part of the great Tabajara nation, lay wigwamed. Her subtle, naked foot scarcely pressed to earth the thin green garment with which the early rains clothed the ground. One day, when the sun was in midday height, she was reposing in a forest clearing. The shade of the Oichisika, more refreshing than the dew of night, bathed her form. The arms of the wild acacia dropped their blossoms upon her wet hair. The birds hidden in the foliage sang for her their sweetest songs. Iracema left the bath. Pearl drops of water stood upon her, like the sweet mangaba which blushes in the refreshing dawn dew. Whilst reposing, she refits her arrows with the plumes of the gara, whilst she joins in the joyous song of the forest sabia perched in the nearest bough. A beautiful Ara, her companion and friend, plays near her. Now the bird climbs the branches and calls the virgin by her name. Then he slips down and shakes the little satchel of colored straw in which the wild maid carries her perfumes, her white threads of the krauta, her needles of the jussara thorn, with which she works the grass cloth, and her dyes that serve to tinge the cotton. A suspicious noise breaks the soft harmony of the siesta. Iracema raises the eyes which no sun can dazzle, and her sight is troubled. Standing before her, absorbed in gazing upon her, is a strange warrior, if indeed it is a warrior, and not some evil spirit of the forest. His face is white as the sands that border the sea. His eyes are sadly blue as the deep. He bears unknown weapons, and is clad in unknown cloths. Rapid as her eye glance was the action of Iracema. An arrow shot from the bow, and red drops ran down the face of the unknown. At the first impulse his nimble hand sought his sword-cross, but presently he smiled. The young warrior had been brought up in the religion of his mother wherein woman is a symbol of tenderness and love. He suffered more in his soul than from his wound. What expression was in his eye and whole face? Who knows? But it made the virgin cast away her bow and wirasaba, and run to the warrior, pained at the pain she had caused. The hand, so swift to strike, more rapidly and gently staunched the dripping stream. Then, Iracema break the murderous arrow. She offered the shaft to the unknown, and she kept the barbed point. The warrior spoke. Dost thou break with me the arrow of peace? Who taught the white warrior the tongue of Iracema's brethren? How came he to these forests, which never saw other warrior like to him? Daughter of the forests, I come from afar. I come from the land which thy brothers once possessed, and wherein mine now dwell. Welcome be the stranger to the prairie of the Tabajadas, lords of the villages, and to the wigwam of Araken, father of Iracema. End of chapter 2《The Honey Lips》，《A Legend of Brazil》，by José de Alencar，translated by Isabel Burton。
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 The stranger followed the virgin through the glades. When the last sun rays fell upon the crest of the mountains, and a turtle dove cooed forth her first lament from the forest depths, they sighted upon the plain beneath them the great Taba. Farther on, hanging as it were from a rock under the shade of the lofty Juazeiro, the wigwam of the Paget. The ancient man was seated at the doorway upon a mat of Carnauba, smoking and meditating on the sacred rites of Tupin. The gentle breath of the breeze fluttered his hair, long, thin and white, as flocks of wool. So statue-like was he, that life only appeared in his hollow, sunken eyes and deep wrinkles. The page descried, nevertheless, from afar, the two forms advancing, he thought, towards a solitary tree, whose dense foliage was casting a long shadow adown the valley before him. When the travellers entered the deep gloom of the wood, his eye, made like the tiger's for darkness, recognized Irasema, and saw that she was followed by a young warrior of a strange race in a far-off land. The Tabajara tribes beyond Ibiapaba were full of a new race of warriors, pale as the flowers of the storm, and coming from the remotest shores to the banks of the Mearim. The old man thought that it was one of these warriors who trod his native ground. Calmly he awaited. The virgin, advancing, pointed to the stranger and said, He came, father. He came well. Tupin sent this guest to the wigwam of Araquim. And thus saying, the page passed the calumet to the stranger, and they both entered the wigwam. The youth took the principal hammock, which was suspended in the center of the habitation. Irasema lighted the fire of hospitality, and brought out food to satisfy hunger and thirst. She produced the spoils of the chase, farinha water, wild fruits, honeycombs, wine of the cajou, and the pineapple. The virgin then went to the nearest spring of fresh water, and returned with the full igasaba to wash the stranger's hands and face. When the warrior had eaten, the venerable Paget extinguished the cachimbo and spoke for the first time. Thou comest. I came, replied the unknown. Thou comest well. The stranger is master in the wigwam of Araquim. The Tabajaras have a thousand warriors to defend him, and women without number to serve him. Let him speak, and all will obey him. Page, I thank thee for thy hospitality. As soon as the sun shall be born, I leave the wigwam and thy prairies where I strayed, but I would not leave them without telling thee who the warrior is whom thou hast made thy friend. It is Tupin whom the page serves. He sent him a guest, and he will take him away again. Araquim has as yet done nothing for him. He does not ask whence he comes, nor whither he goes. If he would sleep, may the happy dreams descend upon him. If he would speak, Araquim listens. The stranger said, I am of the white warriors who raised a taba on the banks of the Jaguaribi, near the sea, where dwell the Pichiguaras, who hate thy blood. My name is Martin, which in thy tongue means son of a warrior. My race is that of the great people who first saw the lands of thy country. Even now my brethren, routed and beaten back, return by sea to the margins of the Paraíba, whence they came, and my chief, abandoned by all, crosses the vast regions of the Apogee. Of so many I alone remain, because I was amongst the Pichiguaras of the Acarau, in the wigwam of the valiant Pochi, brother of Jacauna, who planted with me the friendship tree. Three suns have set since we went forth on the hunting path. I lost sight of my friends, 
and thus I strayed to the prairies of the Tabajaras. It was some bad spirit of the forest that blinded the pale-faced warrior in the darkness of the woods, replied the old man. The Kawan chirped at the other end of the valley. Night had set in. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Chapter Four The pajé shook the maraca rattle and left the cabin, but the stranger remained not alone. Iracema returned with the maidens summoned to serve the guest of Araquém, and the warriors who came to obey him. May happiness rock the white warrior's hammock during the night, and may the sun bring light to his eyes and joy to his soul. Thus saying, Iracema's lip trembled, and the tear stood in her eye. Thou leavest me, then? asked Martin. The most beautiful virgins of the great Taba remain with the warrior. The daughter of Araquém was mistaken in bringing them here for the guest of the pajé. Iracema may not wait upon the stranger. It is she who guards the secret of the Jurema and the mystery of dreams. Her hand prepares for the pajé the drink of Tupin. The Christian warrior crossed the wigwam and disappeared in the darkness. The great village lay in the bottom of the valley, which was illuminated by bonfires. Loud rattled the maraca. The savages were dancing and beating time to their slow surging of the savage song. The inspired Paget headed the sacred rejoicing, and taught to the believers the secrets of Tupin. The principal chief of the Tabajara nation, Irapuã, had descended from the highest point of the Ibiapaba Serra to lead the inland tribes against the Pichiguara foe. The warriors of the valley celebrate the arrival of the chief and the coming fight. The Christian youth saw from afar the glare of the feast-fire, and walked on, gazing at the deep blue, cloudless sky. The dead star glittered upon the dome of the forest, and guided his firm step towards the fresh banks of the Akaraú. When he crossed the valley, as if about to enter the forest, the figure of Iracema arose before him. The virgin had followed the stranger, like the soft and subtle breeze which passes through the tangled wood without stirring a leaf. Wherefore, she murmured, has the stranger left the wigwam of hospitality without taking with him the gift of return? Who harmed the pale-faced warrior in the land of the Tabajaras? The Christian felt the justice of her complaint and his own ingratitude. Daughter of Araquém, no one hurt thy guest. It was a longing to see his friends which made him leave the prairies of the Tabajaras. He did not take the return gift, but he carries in his heart the memory of Iracema. If the memory of Iracema dwelt in the heart of the stranger, it would not suffer him to depart. The wind blows not away the sand of the desert when the sand has drank deep of the waters of rain and the virgin sighed. The pale-faced warrior should wait till Kaubi returns from hunting. The brother of Iracema has quick ears. He can hear the Boisininga amidst all the noises of the forest. He has the eyes of the Oichibo, which sees best in the dark. Kaubi will guide him to the banks of the river of the herons. How long will it be before the brother of Iracema returns to the wigwam of Araquém? The rising sun will bring the warrior Kaubi to the plains of the Ipu. Thy guest will wait, daughter of Araquém. But if the returning sun bring not the brother of Iracema, it will take the pale-faced warrior to the Taba of the Pichiguaras. And Martin returned to the cabin of the Pajé. The white hammock, perfumed by Iracema with Beijoin, gave the guest a calm and sweet sleep. The Christian was lullabied to sleep by the murmurs of the forest and the low, tender song of the Indian maid. End of chapter 4 
Chapter 5 of Iracema, The Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The prairie cock raises his scarlet crest from out his home. His clear trill announces the approach of day. Darkness still covers the earth, but already the savage people roll up the hammocks in the great taba and walk towards the bath. The old pajé, who had watched all night, talking to the stars, and conjuring the bad spirits of the darkness, entered furtively into the wigwam. Lo, thundered forth the bore, filling the valley with its booming sound. The active warriors seized their weapons and rushed to the prairies. When all were collected in the large and circular okada, the chief, Irapuã, sounded the war-cry. Tupan gave to the great Tabajara nation all these grounds. We guard the serras, which supply with water the rivers and the fresh ipus, where grows the maniva and the cotton. We have abandoned to the barbarous Potiguara, eaters of prawns, the naked sands of the sea, with the tablelands wanting wood and water. Now these fishers of the beach, always conquered, give seaway to the white race, the warriors of fire, the enemies of Tupan. Already the Emboabas have stood upon the Jaguaribi River. Soon they will be in the prairies of the Tabajaras, and with them the Potiwaras. Shall we, lords of the villages, do like the dove who hides in her nest while the serpent curls himself along the branches? The excited chief brandishes his tomahawk and hurls it into the middle of the circle. Bending down his forehead, he hid his eyes, ruddy with rage. Irapuã has spoken, at length he said. The youngest of the warriors advances. The sparrow-hawk hovers in the air. When the Nyambu rises, he falls from the clouds and tears out his victim's heart. The young Tabajara warrior, son of the Serra, is like the sparrow-hawk. The posema of war thunders and re-echoes. The young warrior lifted up the tomahawk and in his turn brandished it. Whirled rapidly and menacingly in the air, the chief's weapon passed from hand to hand. The venerable Anjira, brother of the Pajé, let it fall, and stamped upon the ground with his foot, still firm and active. The Tabajaras are struck by this unusual action. A vote of peace from such a tried and impetuous warrior? The old hero, who grew to bloodshed as he grew in years, the ferocious Anjira. Is it he who lets fall the tomahawk, herald of the coming struggle? Uncertain and silent, all gave ear. Anjira, the old Anjira, has drunk more blood in war than all these warriors who now gladden the light of his eyes have drank Kawin at the feasts of Tupin. He has seen more combats in his life than moons which have stripped his brow. How many Pochiwara schools has his implacable hand sculpted before time plucked off his first hair? And old Anjira never feared that the enemy would tread his native ground. He rejoiced at their coming. And as the breath of winter revives a dry tree, he felt youth return to his decrepit body when he scented the war from afar. The Tabajaras are prudent. They will lay aside a tomahawk to play the Mimbi at the feast. Let Irapuan celebrate the coming of the Emboabas, and give them all time to swarm upon our plains. Then Anjira promises him the banquet of victory. Irapuan could no longer restrain his fury. The old bat can remain hidden amongst the wine jars, because he fears the light of day, because he drinks the blood only of the sleeping victim. Irapuan carries the war at the point of his tomahawk. The terror which he inspires flies forward with the hoarse boom of the bore. The Pochiguara already trembles as he hears it roaring in the serra, roaring louder than the rebounding of the sea. End of chapter 5
The Honey Lips, The Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Martin strolls, pace by pace, amongst the tall juazeiros, which encircled the wigwam of the Pajé. It was the hour in which the sweet Aracachi comes up from the sea and spreads over the arid plains its delicious freshness. The plant breathes, and a gentle shiver upraises the green tresses of the forest. The Christian looks upon the setting sun, the shadow gliding down the mountains and covering the valley enters into his soul. He thinks of his native place and the beloved ones he has left behind. He wonders if he shall some day see them again. Nature all round bewails the death of day, murmurs the tremulous, tearful wave, moans the breeze in the foliage, even silence is sorrowful. Iracema stood before the young warrior. Is it the presence of Iracema that disturbs the peace of the stranger's brow? Martin looked softly in the virgin's face. No, daughter of Araquim, thy presence gladdens me like the morning light. It was the memory of my native land that brought a saudade to my anxious soul. A bride awaits him there? The stranger averted his eyes. Iracema's head sank upon her shoulder, like the tender palm of the Carnauba, when the rain overhangs the plains. She is not sweeter than Iracema, the maiden of the honeyed lips, nor more beautiful, murmured the guest. The forest flower is beautiful when it has a branch to shelter it, a trunk round which to entwine itself. Iracema does not live in the soul of a warrior. She never felt the freshness of his smile. Silent were both. Their eyes fell to the ground. They heard not, save the beating of their hearts. The virgin was the first to speak. Gladness shall soon return to the heart of the pale-faced warrior, because Irasema wishes that before nightfall he may see the bride who expects him. Martin smiled at the young girl's artless wish. Come, said the virgin. They crossed the forest and descended into the valley. The wood was thick on the hill skirts. A dense dome of dark green foliage protected the sylvan shrine dedicated to the mysteries of barbarous rites. This was the sacred wood of the Jurema. Around stood the rugged trunks of the Tupin tree. From the boughs, hidden by the thick greenery, hung the sacrificial vases, ashes of the extinct fire which had been used for the feast of the last new moon, still strewed the ground. Before entering this place of mystery, the virgin who was leading the warrior by the hand hesitated, and applied her subtle ear to the sighings of the breeze. Each slight noise of the forest had a meaning for the wild daughter of the desert. However, there was nothing suspicious in the deep respiration of the forest. Iracema signed to the stranger to wait and be silent, whilst she disappeared in the thickest of the wood. The sun still hung over the mountain ridge, and night began to shroud the solitary spot. When the virgin returned, she brought in a leaf, some drops of an unknown green liquor, poured from an igasaba, which she had taken out of the ground. She presented the rude bowl to the warrior. Drink. Martin felt a sleep like death take possession of his eyes. But soon his soul seemed full of light, and strength exhilarated his heart. He lived over again days better and happier than any that he had ever known. He enjoyed the reality of his brightest hopes. 
Behold, he returns to his native land. He kisses his aged mother. He sees the pure angel of his boyish love, more beautiful and more tender than before. Then why, hardly return to his native home, does the young warrior again abandon his father's roof and seek the desert? Now he crosses the forests. Now he arrives at the plains of the Ipu. He seeks in the forest the daughter of the Pajé. He follows the slight trail of the coy virgin, incessantly sighing forth her sweet name to the breeze. Iracema, Iracema. Now he finds her and winds his arm round her sweet form. The young girl, yielding to the warm pressure, hides her face upon the warrior's bosom and trembles there like a timid partridge when its tender mate ruffles with the beak its delicate plume. The warrior, more than once, sighed forth her name and sobbed as though to summon another loving lip. Iracema felt her soul escaping to merge itself in a fiery kiss. And his brow bent low, and already the flower of her smile hung down as though calling to be cold. Suddenly the virgin trembled. Quickly disengaging herself from the arm that encircled her, she seized her bow. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Iracema threaded the trees, silent as a shade. Her sparkling eyes pierced through the foliage like starbeams. She listened to the profound silence of the night and inhaled the balm-blowing breeze. She stopped. A shadow glided amidst the boughs, and the leaves were crackled by a light step, unless, indeed, the report was the buzzing of some insect. Slowly the soft sound waxed louder, and with it the shadow became darker. It was a warrior. With one bound the virgin confronted him, trembling with fear and still more with wrath. Iracema, exclaimed the brave, recoiling. The Ayanga hath doubtless disturbed the sleep of Irapuan, that he has lost himself in the Jurema wood, where no warrior enters save by the will of Araquen. It was not the Ayanga, but the thought of Iracema that disturbed the sleep of the bravest of the Tabajara braves. Irapuan hath descended from his eyrie to follow up the plain the white crane of the river. He came, and Iracema fled from his gaze. The voices of the Taba related in the hearing of the chief that a stranger had sat under the roof-tree of Araquen. The virgin trembled. The warrior fixed upon her his burning eyes. The heart here in Irapuam's breast became a tiger's heart. It panted with rage. He came scenting the quarry. The stranger is in this wood, and Iracema accompanied him. Irapuam will drink all his blood, when that of the white warrior shall fill the veins of the Tabajara chief. Perhaps the daughter of Araquen may love him. The maiden's black pupils flashed in the dark, and a smile of contempt dropped from her lips, bitter as the gouts of castic milk which the euphorbia sheds. Never will Iracema give herself to the basest of the Tabajara braves. The spirit of Tupin alone fills her breast. Vile is the vampire that hides from the light and drinks the blood of the sleeping victim. Daughter of Araquen, provoke not the ounce. 
The name of Irapuã flies farther than the guana of the lake when he scents the rain beyond the mountains. Let the white warrior appear, and let Iracema open her arms to the victor. The white warrior is the guest of Araquém. Peace brought him to the plains of Ipu, and peace guards him here. Whoso offends the stranger shall offend the pajé. The Tabajara chief roared lion-like in his rage. The fury of Irapuã now hears only the vengeance cry. The stranger shall die. The daughter of Araquim is stronger than the chief of warriors, said Iracema, seizing the war trumpet. She holds here the voice of the Tupan god, who calls on his people. But she will not call, said the chief scoffingly. No, because Irapuã shall be punished by the hand of Iracema. His first step will be the step of death. The virgin, with one bound, retreated as much as she had advanced, and drew her bow. The chief still grasped the handle of his formidable tomahawk, but he felt for the first time that it was heavy for his strong arm. The blow that was about to strike Irasema had already wounded his own heart. He then knew how easily the strongest brave is, out of his very strength, vanquished by love. The shadow of Irasema will not always hide the stranger from the vengeance of Irapuã. Vile is the warrior who allows himself to be protected by a woman. Thus saying, the chief vanished amongst the trees. The virgin, always on the watch, returned to the sleeping Christian and guarded him for the rest of the night. The emotions so lately undergone agitated her soul and ripened all those sweet affections of her heart which the stranger's eyes had quickened to life. She longed to protect him from all peril, to shelter him as though she were an impenetrable asylum. Then, deeds following her thoughts, she passed her arms round the sleeping warrior's neck, and she pillowed his head upon her bosom. But when the joy of seeing the stranger saved from the perils of the night had passed away, the thought of new dangers about to arise caused her the liveliest disquiet. The love of Iracema is like the wind of the desert sands. It kills the flower of the forest, sighed the virgin. And slowly she withdrew. End of chapter 7、Chapter、eight of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eight. The white gleam of dawn awoke the day and opened the eyes of the white warrior. The morning light dissolved the visions of the night, and drew from his mind the remembrance of his dream. There remained but a vague sensation, as the perfume of the cactus clings to the forest clump, even after the sharp wind from the mountains has laid it bare in the early morn. He did not know where he was. Leaving the sacred grove, he met Iracema. The virgin was leaning against a rough trunk in the halt. Her eyes were on the ground. The color had fled her cheeks, and her heart trembled upon her lip, like drops of dew on the bamboo frond. No smile, no freshness had the Indian maid. No buds, no flowers. As the acacia scorched by the sun, no azure, no stars has the night when loud jars the wind. The forest bloom has opened to the sun ray. The birds have already sang, said the warrior. Why does only Irasema hang her head and remain silent? The daughter of the pajé trembled. Thus trembles the green palm when its bowl is shaken. Thus the rain tears are showered from its frond. Thus its fans quietly murmur. 
how be the brave is coming to the taba of his brothers. The stranger can depart with the now rising sun. Iracema then would see the stranger go from the prairies of the Tabajara. Then will gladness return to her heart. The Juruti dove abandons the nest wherein she was born when the tree decays. No more shall joy visit the breast of Iracema. She will remain like the bare trunk, without branches, without shade. Martin supported the trembling form of the maiden. She rested wearily upon the warrior's bosom, like the young tendril of the baunilla, which twines tenderly round the sturdy branch of the angico acacia. The youth murmured, Thy guest remains, made with the black eyes. He stays to bring back upon thy cheek the flower of happiness, and to sip like the bee the honey of thy lips. Iracema disengaged herself from the youth's arms and looked at him with sadness. White warrior, Iracema is the daughter of the pajé and keeps the secret of the Jurema draft. The brave that shall possess the virgin of Tupin will die. And Iracema, if thou shouldst die. This word was a sight of agony. The youth's head fell upon his breast but soon he raised his form. The warriors of my race carry death with them, daughter of the Tabajaras. They do not fear it for themselves. They do not spare it to their foes. But never, unless in combat, do they leave open the camosim of the maiden in the wigwam of their host. Truth hath spoken by the mouth of Iracema. The stranger should leave the Tabajara camp should, said the maiden, like an echo. Then her voice sighed forth. The honey of Iracema's lips is like the honeycomb which the bee makes in the trunk of the guabiroba. Poisonous is its sweetness. The maiden with the blue eyes and sunny hair keeps for her brave in the taba of the pale faces the honey of the lily. Martin withdrew quickly and returned but slowly. A word trembled on his lips. The guest will go, that peace may return to Iracema's bosom. And he bears with him the light of Iracema's eyes and the flower of her soul. A strange noise re-echoed through the forest. The youth's glance sped in its direction. It is Calbi the brave's cry of joy, said the maid. Iracema's brother announces his safe return to the prairies of the Tabajara. Daughter of Araquim, conduct thy guest to the wigwam. It is time to depart. They paced side by side, like two fawns who at the sunset hour return through the wood to their nighting place, whence the scent of suspicion is borne by the breeze. When they reached the Juazeiros, they saw Calbi crossing beyond them his broad shoulders bending under the weight of his chase. Iracema went to meet him. The stranger entered the wigwam alone. End of chapter 8the morning sleep weighed down the eyelids of the pajé, like the fair weather mists hang at daybreak over the deep caverns in the mountainside. Martin hesitated, but the sound of his step reached the old man's ear and startled his decrepit frame. Araquin sleeps, murmured the warrior, slackening his pace. The venerable pajé remained motionless. The pajé slumbers, because Tupin hath turned his face to the earth, and the light hath frightened away the evil spirits of darkness. But sleep sits lightly on the eyes of Araquim, like the smoke of the sapé grass on the top of the serra. If the stranger came to see the pajé, 
speak. His ears are open. The guest came to tell Arakin that he is about to go forth. The stranger is lord in the wigwam of Arakin. All the roads are open to him. May Tupin guide him to the taba of his race. Kalbi and Irasema came up. Kalbi has returned, said the Tabajara brave. He brings to Arakin the best of his game. The warrior Kalbi is a mighty huntsman of the mountains and the forests. The eyes of his father are proud to dwell upon him. The old man opened his eyes, but they soon closed again. Daughter of Arakin, choose for thy guest the return gift, and prepare the Mokin for the journey. If the stranger needs a guide, Kalbi, the lord of the path, will accompany him and sleep once more closed his eyes. While Kalbi hung up the quarry over the smoke, Irasema took her own white hammock of cotton, fringed with feathers, and folded it into the uru of plaited straw. Martin awaited her at the doorway of the wigwam, and the maiden came to him and said, Warrior that takest away the sleep from Irasema's eyes, take also her hammock, when he sleeps in it, may dreams of Irasema speak with his heart. Thy hammock, maiden of the Tabajaras, shall be my companion in the wilds. Let the cold wind of night blow fiercely. It will protect the stranger with its warm and breathe the sweet perfume of Irasema's bosom. Kalbi went forth to see his wigwam, which he had not visited since his return. Irasema departed to prepare provisions for the voyage. There remained in the cabin only the pajé who was sleeping aloud, and the youth with his sorrows. The sun was setting when Irasema's brother returned from the great wigwam. The day ends sadly, quoth Kalbi. The nightshade is already failing. It is time to depart. The virgin laid her hand gently on the hammock of Arakin. He goes, murmured her trembling lips. The pajé stood upright in the midst of the wigwam and lit his calumet. He and the youth exchanged a pipe of farewell. Well go the guest, even as he was welcome to the wigwam of Arakin. The old man walked to the door and puffed forth a cloud of smoke upon the wind. Where it had dispersed in thin air, he said, May the Jurupari hide himself and allow the guest of the pajé to pass unmolested. Arakin returned to his hammock and slept again. The youth took his arms, which seemed to be heavier than when he had first hung them to the stakes round the wigwam, and prepared to depart. First went Kalbi. At some little distance followed the stranger, and directly after him, Irasema. They descended the hill and entered the dark forest. Already the sabia of the wood, sweetest songster of eventide, deep hidden in the thick myrtle brake, warbled the prelude of her plaintive song. The virgin sighed forth, The evening is the sorrow of the sun. The days of Irasema will be long evenings, without a morn, until the shadow of the great night shall fall upon her. The youth turned towards her. His lip was silent, but his eyes spoke. One tear coursed down his manly cheek, like the drops which during the summer heat trickle over the scarped rock and disappeared in the dense foliage. The bosom of Arakin's daughter heaved like the overflowing billow fringed with surf, and she sobbed aloud. But in her soul, so dark with sorrow, burned a faint spark which lit up her cheeks. Thus, in the blackness of night, a fire drape glimmers over the white sands of the highland plateau. Stranger, take the last smile of Irasema and fly. The warrior caught her in his arms and placed his lips to her. They were as twin fruits of the Arasa shrub, both sprung from the womb of the same flower. The voice of Kalbi called the stranger by name 
and Inasima remained clinging for support to the trunk of a palm. End of chapter 9、Chapter 10 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 In the silent wigwam meditates the old page. Iracema leans against the rugged trunk that serves as a stay. Her large black eyes, fixed on the forest clearings and sunk with sorrow, gaze with long and tremulous looks, threading and unthreading the sea pearl of teardrops that bedew her cheeks. The ara, perched on the opposite shelf, Views with sad green eyes her beautiful lady. From the day that saw the white warrior tread Tabajara land, she had been forgotten by Iracema. The rosy lips of the maid never open now to let her pick from them the fruity pulp or the paste of the green maize, nor ever now did the sweet hand caress her or smooth the golden plumage of her head. If she spoke, if she spoke the beloved name of her mistress, the smile of Iracema was never bent upon her, nor did the ear of the mistress even appear to know the voice of that companion and friend which had once been so dear to her heart. Woe to her! The Tupi nation called her Jandaya, because in her joy she made the plains resound with her vibrating song. But now, sad and silent, because disdained by her mistress, she appeared no more the beautiful Jandaya, but rather the homely Urutão, which knows only to groan. Low sloped the sun over the Serra heights, its rays hardly gilded the highest crests. The hushed melancholy of evening, which precedes the silence of night, Began to oppress the various sounds of the prairie. Here and there, a night bird, deceived by the thicker darkness of the forest, screeched aloud. The old man raised his bald forehead. Was it not the cry of the Inuma bird that awoke the ear of Arakain? said he, wondering. The maiden trembled. Already she was out of the wigwam. And back to answer the pajé's question. It is the war cry of Kaubi the brave. When the second screech of the midnight bird reached her ear, Inasema ran towards the forest, fleet as a doe pursued by the hunter. She never drew breath till she had reached the clearing, which lay in the wood like a long lake. The first thing that met her eye was Martin. Sitting tranquilly upon a sapopema bough, and eyeing all that occurred, opposite him, a hundred Tabajara warriors, with Irapuan at their head, formed a circle. The brave Kaubi, his eye flashing with anger, and his weapons grasped in his muscular arm, stood up before them all. Irapuan had demanded the stranger. And the guy had answered him simply, "Slay Kaubi first." The daughter of the pajé flew like an arrow. Behold her graceful form shielding Martin from the blows of the braves. Irapuan roared with rage, as roars the alms attacked in its lair. "Daughter of Arakin," said Kaubi in a whisper, "lead the stranger to the wigwam. Arakin alone can save him." Irasema turned towards the white warrior. Come. He remained immovable. If the stranger will not come, Irasema will die with him. Marching arose, but far from following the maiden, he walked straight towards Irapuã. His sword flashed in the air. Chief, the braves of my race have never refused combat. If he whom thou beholdest. Did not seek it. It was because his fathers have forbidden him to shed blood in the land of hospitality. The Tabajara chief yelled with joy. 
his powerful arm wielded the tomahawk. But the two champions had scanty time to measure each other with the eye. When the first blow was being struck, Kaubi and Iracema were between them. In vain the daughter of Araquem besought the Christian. Vainly did she throw her arms round him, endeavoring to withdraw him from the combat. On his side, Kaubi as vainly strove to provoke Irapuã and to draw upon himself the wrath of the chief. At a sign from Irapuã, the warrior seized the brother and sister, and the combat began. Suddenly, the hoarse sound of the war trumpet thundered through the forest. The sons of the Serra trembled as they recognized the boom of the seashell and the war cry of the Pichiguaras, those lords of the shores which the fallen trees shade. The echo came from the great wigwam, which perhaps the enemy was at that moment attacking. The warriors flew there, carrying with them their chiefs. With the stranger only remained the daughter of Araquim. End of chapter 10There was no trace of the Pichiguaras. Yet the well-known war-boom of the shell from the shores had sounded in the ears of the mountain braves. Of this none doubted. Irapuã suspected that it was a stratagem of the daughter of Araquem to save the stranger, and he went straight to the wigwam of the Pajé, as the Guará runs along the skirts of the forest, when following the trail of the escaping prey, so did the wrathful warrior hurry his steps. Araquim saw the great Tabajara chief enter his cabin, but he did not move. Sitting on his hammock with crossed legs, he was giving ear to Irasema. The maiden related the events of the evening. Beholding the sinister countenance of Irapuã, she sprang to her bow and placed herself by the white warrior's side. Martin put her gently away and advanced a few steps. The protection with which the Tabajara maid surrounded him, a warrior, annoyed him. Araquim, the vengeance of the Tabajaras demands the white warrior. Irapuã comes to fetch him. The guest is the beloved of Tupã soul molests the stranger, shall hear the voice of his thunder. It is the stranger who has offended Dupin, robbing him of his virgin, who keeps the dreams of the Jurema draft. The mouth of Irapuan lies, like the hiss of the jiboya, exclaimed Iracema. Martin said, Irapuan is vile and unworthy to be the chief of braves. The pajé spoke slow and solemnly. If the virgin has yielded the flower of her chastity to the white warrior, she will die. But the guest of Tupin is sacred. None shall touch him. All shall serve him. Irapuan raged. His hoarse growl rumbled within his muscular chest, like the noise made by the sukuri in the depths of the river. The wrath of Irapuan's anger will not let him hearken to the old pajé. It will fall upon him if he dare to withdraw the stranger from the vengeance of the Tabajaras. At this moment, the venerable Anjira, brother of the pajé, entered the cabin. He grasped the terrible tomahawk, and a still more terrible fury gleamed in his eyes. The vampire comes to suck Irapuam's blood, if indeed it is blood, and not honey, that runs in the veins of him 
who dares to threaten the old Pajé in his wigwam? Araken stayed his brother. Peace and silence, Anjira. The Pajé raised his tall, thin stature, and appeared like the angry viper who crouches on the ground, the better to spring upon his victim. His wrinkles waxed deeper, whilst his shrunken lips displayed his white and sharpened teeth. Let Irapua venture one step more, and the wrath of Tupin shall crush him with the weight of this lean and withered hand. At this moment, Tupin is not with the Bajé, replied the chief. The Bajé left, and the sinister laugh seemed to roll round the enclosure like the bark of the Ariranha. Hear his thunder, and let the warrior's soul tremble as the earth in its depths. Araken, pronouncing these terrible words, advanced to the middle of the wigwam. There he lifted up a great stone and stamped with force upon the ground, which suddenly clave asunder. A frightful noise, which seemed torn from the bowels of the earth, issued out from the dark cavern. Irapuã neither trembled nor turned pale, but he felt his sight growing dim, and his lips lost their power of speech. The Lord of Thunder is for the Pajé. The Lord of War will be for Irapuã. The grim warrior left the wigwam, and soon his mighty form disappeared in the twilight. The Pajé and his brother resumed their conversation in the doorway. Martin, still surprised at what he had beheld, could not take his eyes off the deep cavern, which the stamp of the old Pajé had opened in the ground. A dull sound, like the distant boom of the waves breaking upon the shore, still echoed through the depths. The Christian warrior reflected. He could not believe that the god of the Tabajaras had given such immense power to his priest. Araken, perceiving what was passing in the mind of the stranger, lit the cachimbo and seized the maracá, or mystic rattle. It is time, he said, to appease the wrath of Tupin and to hush the voice of his thunder. So saying, he left the cabin. Irasema then approached the youth with laughing mouth, with laughing mouth and eyes sparkling with joy. The heart of Irasema is like the rice plant, glad in the waves of the river. None can hurt the white warrior in the wigwam of Araken. Keep away from the enemy, Tabajara maid, replied the stranger in a harsh voice. And retiring quickly to the opposite side of the wigwam, he hid his face from the tender, complaining looks of the virgin. What has Irasema done that the white warrior should turn away his eyes from her, as if she were the worm of the earth? The maiden's words, gently whispered, reached Matching's heart. Thus whispered the murmurs of the breeze in the fen leaves of the palm tree. The youth felt anger against himself and sorrow for her. Dost thou not hear, beautiful virgin? exclaimed he, pointing to the speaking cave. It is the voice of Tupin. Thy God speaks by the mouth of his pajé. If the virgin of Tupin yield to the stranger the flower of her chastity, she shall die. Yasema hung her head. It is not the voice of Tupin that the pale-faced warrior hears, but the song of the white virgin that calls to him. Suddenly, the strange sounds which came from the depths of the earth ceased, and there was so deep a silence in the wigwam that the pulses throbbing through the warrior's veins and the sighs that trembled on the virgin's lips were heard. End of chapter 11
Chapter Twelve of Iracema, The Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. The day darkened. Night was already coming on. The pajé returned to the wigwam, and again poising the slab of stone, closed with it the mouth of the subterranean passage. Calbi also arrived from the great taba, where he and his brother braves had retired after beating the forest in search of the Pichiguara enemy. In the center of the wigwam, amidst the hammocks, slung and squared, Iracema spread the mat of Carnauba palm, and served the remains of the game with the wines made during the last moon. The Tabajara brave alone relished the supper. The gall which is wrung from the heart by sorrow did not embitter his palate. The pajé drew from his calumet the sacred smoke of Tupin, which filled the depths of his lungs. The stranger greedily inhaled the fresh air to cool his boiling blood. The maiden seemed to sigh her soul away like honey dropping from the calm in the frequent sobs that burst from her trembling lips. Calbi soon retired to the great taba. The pajé still inhaled the smoke which prepared him for the mysteries of the sacred rite. There arises in the night silence a vibrating cry which ascends to the sky. Martin raises up his head and listens. Again a similar sound is heard. The warrior whispers, so that only the maiden could hear him. Hast heard Iracema the seagull's cry? Iracema has heard the cry of a bird which she does not know. It is the Achiachi, the heron of the sea, and Iracema is the mountain maid who has never trotted upon the white beach upon which the waves break. The beach belongs to the Pichiguaras, the lords of the palm groves. The warriors of the great tribe who inhabited the seaboards call themselves Pichiguaras, lords of the valleys. But the Tabajaras, their enemies, contemptuously term them Pochiwaras, or shrimp eaters. Iracema did not wish to offend the white warrior, and therefore, when speaking of the Pichiguaras, she gave them the warlike name which they had chosen for themselves. The stranger reflected, and retained for a moment, on the lip of prudence, the word which he was about to utter. The seagull's song is the war cry of the brave Pochi, the friend of thy guest. The maiden trembled for her brethren. The fame of the fierce Pochi, brother of Jacauna, had spread afar from the seashore to the heights of the Serra. Scarcely was there a wigwam which had not panted with a lust of vengeance. In almost all of them, the blow of his unerring tomahawk had laid a warrior low in his camosim. Iracema thought that Pochi came at the head of his braves to deliver his friend. Doubtless it was he who had sounded the seashell at the time when the combat began. It was therefore in a tone of mixed sadness and sweetness, that she replied, The stranger is saved. The brethren of Iracema will die, for she will not speak. Cast out this grief from thy soul, Tabajara maid. The stranger, in leaving thy prairies, will not leave in them, like the famished tiger, a trail of blood. Iracema took the hand of the white warrior and kissed it. The stranger's smile, she continued, blunts the remembrance of the harm they wish me. Martin rose and walked to the door. Where goes the white warrior? To seek Pochi. The guest of Araquim may not leave this wigwam, for the warriors of Irapuan will kill him. A warrior owes his life to God and to his weapons only. 
he will not be protected by old men and women. Why is one brave against a thousand? The Tamandua is brave and strong, yet the cats of the mountains kill and eat him, because they are so many. The arms of the white warrior only reach as far as the shadow of his body. Those of the Tabajaras fly high and straight as the Anaji. Every warrior has his day. The stranger would not see Rasima die, yet he would make her behold his death. Martin hesitated, perplexed. Irasema will go and meet the Pichiguara chief, and will bring to her guest the words of his warrior friend. The pajé finally awoke from his reverie. The maraca rattled in his right hand. The bells rang in time to his stiff, slow step. He called his daughter apart. If the braves of Irapuã fall upon the wigwam, lift up the stone, and hide the stranger in the bosom of the earth. The guest must not be left alone. Wait till Iracema returns. The Inuma has not yet sung. The old man again sat upon his hammock. The maiden went forth after fastening the door of the wigwam. End of chapter 12、13. Of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar. Translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The daughter of Araquen advances in the darkness. She stands and listens. For the third time, the cry of the seagull sounds in her ears. She bends her steps straight to the place whence it came. And arrives at the edge of a lake. Her glance pierces the darkness, but finds naught of what it seeks. The tender voice, soft as the hum of the colibri bird, breaks the silence. Pochi, the brave's white brother, calls him by the mouth of Irasema. Echo only answered her. The daughter of his foes comes to seek him. Because the stranger loves him, and she loves the stranger. The smooth surface of the lake clove, and the figure appeared swimming towards the margin and rising from the water. Was it Martin who sent it as Sema, since she knows the name of Pochi, his brother in war? The Pichiguara chief may speak. The white warrior is waiting. Then it as Sema will return and tell him that Pochi has come to save him. The stranger knows, and sent Irasema to hear Pochi's tidings. The words of Pochi will leave his mouth only for the ear of his white brother. He must wait then, till Araquin leaves, and the wigwam remains deserted. Then will Irasema guide him to the presence of the stranger. Never, daughter of the Tabajaras, has a Pichiguara brave crossed the threshold of a foeman's wigwam, save as a conqueror. Bring here the warrior of the sea. The vengeance of Irapuã hovers around the wigwam of Araquen. Has the stranger's brother brought Pichiguara warriors enough to defend and to save him? Pochi reflected. Relate, maid of the mountains, all that has happened in this prairie since the warrior of the sea planted foot upon them. Irasema related all how the wrath of Irapuã had burst forth against the stranger. Until the voice of Tupin, invoked by the pajé, had appeased his fury. The anger of Irapuã is like that of the bat. He fears the light and flies only in the dark. The hand of Pochi suddenly closed the maiden's lips. His words sank to a whisper. The virgin of the forest must hold her breath and hush her voice. The foeman's ear listens in the dark. The leaves gently rustled. As if trodden upon by the restless mambu, the sound at first came from the skirts of the forest, and then swept towards the valley. The valley and Pochi, gliding along the grass like the clever prawn from which he took his name in quickness, disappeared in the deep lake. The water, without a murmur, buried him in its limpid wave. 
Iracema returned to the wigwam. On the way, she perceived the shadows of many warriors who were crawling on the ground like the Intanya frog. Araken, seeing her come in, left the wigwam. The Tabajara maid related to Martin all that had passed between herself and Pochi. The Christian warrior rose up impetuously to rescue his Pichiguara brother. Iracema threw round his neck her beautiful arms. The chief does not want his brother. He is the son of the waters, and the waters will protect him. Later, the stranger's ear shall listen to the words of his friend. Iracema, it is time that thy guest should leave the wigwam of the Pajé and the plains of the Tabajaras. He does not fear the braves of Irapuã. He fears the eyes of the Virgin of Tupin. He will fly from them? The stranger must fly from them, as the Oichibó does from the morning star. Martin hastened his steps. Ungrateful brave, go slay first brother, then self. Iracema will follow him to the happy plains where wend the shades of those that were. Kill my brother, says thou, cruel maid? Thy trail will guide the enemy to his hiding place. The Christian halted suddenly, midway in the wigwam, and there remained silent and still. Iracema, fearing to look upon him, fixed her eyes on his shadow, which the bright embers of the fire threw on the broken wall of the wigwam. The shaggy dog, lying close to the hot ashes, gave signs that a friend was approaching. The door, interwoven with the fronds of the Carnaupa palm, was opened from without. Kaubi entered. The Kauin wine has disturbed the spirit of the braves. They are coming to slay the stranger. The maiden arose impetuously. Lift up the stone which closes the throat of Dupin, that he may conceal the guest. The Tabajara brave uphove the enormous slab and poised it on the ground. The son of Araken shall lie across the wigwam door, and if a brave pass over his body, let him rise no more from the ground. Kaupi obeyed. The maiden fastened the door. A few moments passed. The war cry of the braves sounds closer. The angry voices of Irapuan and Kaubi rise above the rest. They come, but Tupin will save his guest. At this moment, as if the thunder god had heard the words of his virgin, the cave, which till then was still, roared with a dull roar. Listen, it is the voice of Tupin. Irasema presses the warrior's hand and leads him into the cave. They descend together into the bowels of the earth. End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. The Tabajara Braves excited by their copious libations of foaming kauin, were inflamed by the voice of Irapuã, who had so often led them to victory. Wine appeases the thirst of the body, but breeds another and a wilder thirst in the savage mind. The braves yell vengeance against the audacious stranger who had defied their arms, and who had offended the god of their fathers and their war-chief, the greatest of the Tabajaras. Then they leapt with rage and rushed about in the darkness. The red light of the Ubiratã, which shone in the distance, guided them to the cabin of Araken. From time to time, the foremost of those who came to spy the enemy raised themselves up from the ground. The Pajá is in the forest, they murmured. And the stranger, inquired Irapuã. In the cabin, with Iracema. The great chief leaps up with a terrific bound and reaches the wigwam door followed by his warriors. The face of Kaubi appears at the entrance. His arms guarded a space in front of him, say within the reach of a maracajá spring. 
Dastardly are the braves who attack in herds like the Kaitetus, the jaguar, lord of the forest, and the anaji, lord of the clouds. Combat the enemy alone. Dirt be in the vile mouth which raises its voice against the bravest of the Tabajara braves. Saying these words, Irapuã brandished his fatal tomahawk, but his arms stopped in the air. The bowels of the earth again rumbled, as they had rumbled when Araquen awoke the awful voice of Tupan. The braves raise a cry of fear, and surrounding their chief, force him away from the funest spot and the wrath of Tupan, so evidently roused against them. Calbi once more lay down across the threshold. His eyes sleep, but his ears keep watch. The voice of Tupan became silent. Irasema and the Christian, lost in the depths of the earth, descended into a deep grotto. Suddenly, a voice arising from the cavernous depths filled their ears. Does the sea warrior listen to the words of his brother? It is Pochi, the friend of thy guest, said the Christian to the maid. Irasema trembled. He speaks by the mouth of Tupan. Marching then answered the Pichiguada. The words of Pochi enter into the soul of his brother. Does no other ear listen? None save those of the virgin, who twice in one son has saved the life of thy brother. Woman is weak, the Tabajara is revengeful, and the brother of Jacauna is prudent. Iracema sighed, and lay her head upon the youth's breast. Lord of Iracema, stop her ears that she may not listen. Martin gently put away the graceful head. The Pichiguara chief may speak. The ears that listen are friendly and faithful. His brother orders, and Pochi speaks. Ere the sun shall rise over the serra, the sea warrior must seek the river plain of the heron's nests. The dead star will guide him to the white beach. No Tabajara brave will follow him, because the Inubia of the Pichiguaras will sound from the mountainside. How many Pichiguara braves accompany their valiant chief? Not one. Pochi came alone with his arms. When the bad spirits of the forest separated the sea warrior from his brother, Pochi followed his trail. His heart would not let him return to call the braves of his taba, but he sent his faithful dog to the great Jacauna. The Pichiguara chief is alone. He must not sound the Inubia, which will raise all the Tabajara braves against him. He must do it to save his white brother. Pochi will mock at Irapuã as he mocked him when he fought with a hundred men against his white brother. The daughter of the pajé, who had listened silently, now bent towards the Christian's ear. Irasema would save the stranger and his brother. She knows her thoughts. The Pichiguara chief is staunch and brave. Irapuã is crafty and treacherous as the Akawã. Before the stranger can reach the forest, he must fall, and his brother must also fall with him. What can the Tabajara maid do to save the stranger and his brother? asked Martin. One more sun, and another must rise. Then the moon of flowers will appear. It is the feast time, when the Tabajara braves pass the night in the sacred wood, and receive from the pajé their happy dreams. When they are all sleeping, the white warrior will leave the plains of Ipu and will vanish from the eyes of Irasema, but not from her soul. Martin strained the maiden to his breast, but soon he gently repelled her. The contact of her beautiful form, sweet as the forest lily, warm as the nest of the beja flor, was as a thorn in his heart, for he remembered the awful warning of the pajé. The voice of the Christian repeated to Pochi the project of Iracema. The Pichiguara chief, prudent as the Tamanduá, took thought and then replied, Wisdom has spoken by the mouth of the Tabajara virgin. Pochi will wait the moon of flowers. End of chapter 14《Chapter 15 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, 
translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The day was born and dead. The fire, companion of the night, already shone in the wigwam of Araquen. The stars, daughters of the moon, rolled their slow and silent courses in the blue heavens, awaiting the return of their absent mother. Martin gently rocked himself, and his soul, like the white hammock which waved from side to side, wavered between one and another thought. There the pale-faced virgin awaited him with chaste affection. Here the dark maiden smiled upon him with ardent love. Irasema leant languidly against the head of the hammock. Her large black eyes, tender as those of the sabia thrush, sought the stranger and pierced his soul. The Christian smiled. The virgin, trembling like the sahi bird, fascinated by the serpent, bent her yielding form and reclined upon the warrior's bosom. He strained her passionately to his heart. His lips sought her longing lip. And thus they celebrated, in the sanctuary of the soul, the hymen of love. In a dark, obscure corner sat the pajet, plunged in the contemplation of things remote from this world. He heaved one long, sad sigh. Did his heart forebode that which his eyes could not see? Or was it some ill-omened presentiment? concerning the future of his race, which re-echoed in the soul of Araquen. No one ever knew. The Christian gently repelled the Indian girl. He would not leave a trail of disgrace in the hospitable wigwam. He closed his eyes that he might not see her, and endeavored to fill his thoughts with the name and the fear of God. Christ! Jesus, Mary. A calm returned to the warrior's breast, but every time his eye rested upon the Tabajara virgin, he felt the blood course through his veins like liquid fire. Thus, when the thoughtless child stirs the live embers, its sparks fly out and consume its flesh. The Christian shut his eyes, but amid the darkness of his thoughts, the Tabajara virgin ever arose, and ever more beautiful. In vain his heavy lids invoked sleep. They opened, despite all his endeavors. An inspiration from heaven at last descended upon his troubled mind. Beautiful maid of the desert, this is the last night of thy guest under the roof of Araquen. Would that he had never come here. For thy sake and for his own, make his sleep glad and happy. Let the warrior command, and Irasema will obey. What can she do to make him glad? The Christian murmured low, that the old Pajé might not hear him. The virgin of Tupã keeps the dreams of the Jurema, which are sweet and pleasant. A sad smile was Irasema's answer. The stranger is going to live forever, encircling the white virgin. Never more will his eyes behold the daughter of Araquim. Yet he wishes that sleep should close his lids, and that dreams should convey him back to the land of his brothers. Sleep is the warrior's rest, said Machin, and dreams are the gladness of his soul. The stranger would not bear sadness with him from the land of hospitality nor would he leave it in the heart of Irasema. The virgin sat, unmoved. Go, and return with the wine of Tupin. When Irasema came back, the pajé was no longer in the wigwam. She drew from her bosom the bowl which she had hidden under her carioba of cotton, interwoven with feathers. Martin seized it from her hands, and drained the few drops of bitter green liquid. Presently, the hammock received his torpid form. 
Now he may live with Iracema, and gather the kisses from her lips, which ripen there midst smiles, like the fruit in the corolla of the flower. He may love her, and may savor the honey and perfume of this love, without leaving its poison in the virgin's breast. The joy was life, only more real and intense. The evil was a dream, an illusion. To him, the maiden was an image, a shadow. Iracema withdrew, silent and sorrowful. The warrior's arms opened, and his lips gently murmured her name. The Juruti, flitting about the forest, hears the tender cooing of her mate. She flutters her wings and flies to meet him in the warm nest. Thus, the virgin of the desert nestled in the warrior's arms. When morning came, it found Irasema sleeping like a butterfly in the petals of the beautiful cactus. Her cheek was suffused with the blushes of modesty. And as the first sunbeam sparkles through the early dawn, on her brightened face shone the happy smile of the bride, the aurora of happy love. Martin, seeing Iracema still pressed to his heart, thought that the dream continued, and closed his eyes not to disturb it. The possema trump of the braves thundering through the valley awoke him from the sweet illusion. He knew then that he was alive and awake. His cruel hands mothered the kiss which expanded like a flower on the bride's lips. The kisses of Irasema are sweet in dreams. The white warrior fills his soul with them. But in life, the lips of the Virgin of Tupin are bitter and painful, like the Jurema thorns. The daughter of Araquen hid her joy in her heart. She was hushed and startled like the bird which feels the coming storm. She quickly withdrew from the wigwam and plunged into the river according to custom. The Jandaya never returned to the wigwam, and Tupin no longer owned his virgin in the Tabajara land. End of chapter 15《Chapter 16 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 The moon's white disk rose slowly above the horizon. The brightness of the sun pales the virgin of the heavens, as the warrior's love blanches the wife's cheek. Jassi, our mother! exclaimed the Tabajara warriors, and brandishing their bows, they chanted the song of the new moon, discharging at her showers of arrows. Thou art come into the heavens, O mother of the braves! Thou turnest thy face once more to behold thy sons. Thou bringest waters to fill the rivers, and pulp to the caju nut. Thou art come, O bride of the sun, Thy daughters, the virgins of the earth, smile at thy approach. May thy soft light bring love into the hearts of the brave, and make fruitful the young mother's bosom. The evening was falling. The women and children sported in the vast Okara. The youths, who had not yet won their name by notable deeds, were running races in the valley. The warriors followed Irapuã to the sacred wood, where the pajé and his daughter awaited them for the mysteries of the jurema. Iracema had already lit the fires of joy. Araquen remained statue-like and ecstatic in the center of a cloud of smoke. Each warrior, on arriving, placed at his feet an offering for Tupin. One brought the succulent game, another water flower, the third piracin of the traíra, and so on, each in turn. The old pajé, for whom were the gifts, received them with disdain. When all had taken seat round the great fire, the priest of Tupin 
commanded silence by a gesture, and three times pronounced aloud the dread name, as though to fill himself with the god who inspired him. Tupin! 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 Three times the distant echoes answered the name. Iracema came with the Igasaba full of the green liquor. Araquen decreed to each warrior his dreams, and distributed the wine of the Jurema, which was to transport the Tabajara brave to the happy land. The mighty hunter dreamed that stags and pacas ran to meet his arrows and transfix themselves. At length, tired of wounding them, he dug the bucan in the earth, and roasted so much game that a thousand warriors could not finish it in a year. The conqueror of hearts dreamt that the most beautiful of the Tabajara virgins left their father's wigwams to follow him, slaves to his will and pleasure. Never had the hammock of any chief witness the reality of such wild, warm visions. The hero's vision was of tremendous struggles and fearful combats, whence he always issued victorious and covered with fame and glory. The old man saw his youth renewed in his numerous offspring, like a dry trunk acquiring new strength and sap, and still sprouting into buds and flowers. All felt such lively, such lasting happiness, that in one night they lived many moons. Their lips murmured, their gestures spoke, and the pajé, who saw and heard all, gathered from their unveiled souls their most secret thoughts. When Iracema had offered to each brave the wine of Tupin, she left the wood. The rites did not permit her to be present at the sleep of the warriors, nor hear and see their dreams. She went her way straight to the cabin where Martin awaited her. Let the white warrior take up his arms. It is time to go. Lead me to my brother, Pochi. The bride made straight for the valley, the Christian following her. They reached the rock base which fell sloping with clumps of foliage upon the margin of the lake. Let the stranger call his brother. Martin imitated the cry of the seagull. The stone which closed the entrance of the grotto fell, and the figure of Pochi the brave appeared in the gloom. The two brothers pressed forehead to forehead and breast to breast, showing that they had but one heart. Pochi is happy, because he sees his brother, whom the bad spirit of the forest had borne away from his sight. Happy is the brave who has a friend at his side like the valiant Pochi. All the other warriors will envy him. Dasima sighed, thinking that the affection of the Pichiguara sufficed to the happiness of the stranger. The Tabajara braves sleep. The daughter of Arakin will guide the strangers. The bride led the way. The two warriors followed behind. When they had gone about the distance of a heron's flight, the Pichiguara chief began to be uneasy, and whispered in the ear of the Christian, My brother had better send the daughter of the Pajé back to the wigwam of her father. The warriors could march quicker without her. Martin felt a sudden sadness, but the voice of prudence and friendship prevailed in his heart. He advanced to Iracema, and spoke softly to soothe her sorrow. The deeper the root in the earth, the harder it is to withdraw the plant. Each step Iracema takes on the road of farewell is a root which she plants in the heart of her guest. Iracema would accompany him as far as the borders of the Tabajara land, in order to return with more calmness in her breast. Martin did not answer. They continued their march, and as they walked, the night fell, the stars paled, and finally the freshness of dawn gladdened the forest. The morning clouds, purely white as cotton, appeared in the heavens. Pochi looked at the forest and stopped. Martin understood, and said to Iracema, 
Thy guest no longer treads on the lands of the Tabajaras. It is the right moment to bid him farewell. End of chapter 16、Chapter、Seventeen of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen. Iracema placed her hand upon the bosom of the white warrior. The daughter of the Tabajaras has now left the land of her fathers, and she may speak. What keepest thou within thy bosom, beautiful daughter of the forest? She gazed with brimming eyes at the Christian. Iracema cannot tear herself from the stranger. Yet thus it must be, daughter of Araquen. Return to the cabin of thine old father, who awaits thee. Araquen has no longer a daughter. Martin turned towards her with a harsh and severe gesture. A warrior of my race never leaves the wigwam of his host, widowed of its joy. Araquen will embrace his daughter, and shall not curse the ungrateful stranger. The girl hung her head. Veiled in the long black tresses which hung about her neck, she crossed her beautiful arms over her bosom, and stood, robbed in her modesty. Thus the rosy cactus, before opening into a lovely flower, retains within its breast the perfumed bud. Thy slave will accompany thee, white warrior, because thy blood sleeps in her bosom. Martin trembled. The bad spirits of the night have disturbed the spirit of Iracema. The white warrior was dreaming when Tupin abandoned his virgin, because she betrayed the secret of the Jurema. The Christian hid his face from the light. O、oh, God! exclaimed his trembling lip. Both remained silent. At last, Pucci spoke. The Tabajara warriors awake. The heart of the bride, like that of the stranger, was deaf to the voice of prudence. The sun arose in the horizon, and his majestic glance descended from the wooded uplands to the forest. Pochi stood, like a solitary tree trunk, waiting for his brother to give the signal for departure. It was Iracema who broke silence. Come, the life of the warrior is in danger. Until he treads the Pichiguara land. Martin followed the girl silently, and she flitted before him amongst the trees like the timid Akochi. Sorrow preyed upon his heart, but the perfume wafted on the air by the passage of the beautiful Tabajara, fanned the love in his warrior breast. Still, his step was slow, and his breathing was oppressed. Pochi reflected. In his youthful brain had lived the spirit of an abayete. The Pichiguara chief thought the love is like Hawi, which, drunk with moderation, fortifies the brave, but in excess weakens the hero's courage. He knew how fleet was the Tabajara's foot, and he expected the moment when he must die defending his friend. As the shades of the evening began to sadden the day, the Christian stopped in the middle of the forest. Pochi lit the fire of hospitality. The bride unfolded the white hammock of cotton, fringed with the feathers of the toucan, and hung it to the branches of a tree. Husband of Iracema, thy hammock awaits thee. The daughter of Araquen then went and sat afar off on the root of a tree. Like a solitary doe, who has been driven forth from the sunny plain by her ungrateful mate, the Pichiguara warrior disappeared in the thickest of the foliage. Machin sat silent and sorrowful, like the trunk of some tree from which the wind has torn the beautiful cypaw which embraced it. The passing breeze at last bore on it one murmur: "The same." Was the cry of the mate, the wounded doe flew back to the sunny plain. 
a forest distilled its sweetest fragrance and was vocal with its most harmonious music. The sighs of the heart mingled with the whispers of the wilderness. It was the feast of love, the song of Hymen. Already the morning light pierced the dense thicket when the solemn and sonorous voice of Pochi sounded amidst the hum and the buzz of waking life. The Tabajaras walk through the forest. Iracema sprang from the arms that encircled her and from the lips which held her captive, sprang from the hammock lightly to the ground, like the agile Zabeli, and seizing the weapons of her spouse, led him into the depths of the bush. From time to time, the prudent Pochi laid his ear to the face of earth, and his head inclined from side to side, as the cloud on the summit of a rock waves with every puff of the coming storm. What does the ear of the warrior Pochi hear? It listens to the flying step of the Tabajara. He comes like the tapir, tearing through the forest. The Pichiguara warrior is like the ostrich, which flies on the earth. We will follow him like his wings, said Iracema. The chief shook his head anew. Whilst the sea warrior slept, the enemy ran. Those who first set out are now near, as the horns are to the bow. Shame gnawed the heart of Martin. Let the chief Pochi fly and save Iracema. The bad warrior, who would not listen to the voice of his brother and the wish of his bride, can only die. Martin began to retrace his steps. The soul of the white warrior does not listen to his mouth. Pochi and his brother have but one life. The lip of Iracema spoke not, only smiled. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of Iracema, The Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 The forest literally trembled as it echoed the career of the Tabajara braves. The form of Irapuã the Great first looms amidst the trees. His suffused eye caught sight of the white warrior through a cloud of blood. A hoarse and tiger-like roar burst from his brawny chest. The Tabajara chief and his tribe were about to fall upon the fugitives like the swollen waves which break on the Mokoribi's flank. But hush! In the distance sounds the bark of the Indian dog. Pochi gave a cry of joy. It is Pochi's hound that guides the warriors of his taba to save his brother. The hoarse seashell of the Pichiguaras bellowed through the forest. The great Jacauna, lord of the seashores, was marching from the river of the herons with the best of his braves. The Pichiguaras received the first assault of the foe on the jagged heads of their shafts which they loosed in showers like the porcupine raising his quills. Presently resounded the war posema of the Tabajaras. The space between the enemies was narrowed, and the hand-to-hand -hand combat began. Jacauna attacked Irapuã. The horrible fight was that of ten braves, yet it did not exhaust the strength of the two great chiefs. When their tomahawks clashed, the battle trembled to the heart as one man. The brother of Iracema came straight to the stranger, who had taken the daughter of Araquem from the hospitable wigwam. The trail of vengeance led him. The sight of his sister maddened him. Kaubi, the brave, furiously assaults the enemy. Iracema remained by the side of her warrior and spouse. She saw Kaubi from afar and cried, Let the lord of Iracema listen to the prayer of his slave. Let him not shed the blood of the son of Araquem. If the warrior Kaubi must die, let it be by the hand of Iracema, not by his. Martin looked at the savage with eyes of horror. Would Iracema slay her brother? 
the Sima would see the blood of Kaubi stain her hand rather than the hand of her lord, because the eyes of Hirasima dwell upon him and not upon herself. The battle still rages. Kaubi fights with fury. The Christian hardly defends himself, but the poisoned arrows from the young wife's bow save him from the blows of the enemy. Pochi had already laid low the old Anjira and all the braves who during the struggle had encountered his good tomahawk. Martin leaves to him the son of Araquen and seeks out Irapuã. Jacauna is a great chief. His war collar thrice encircles his neck. This Tabajara belongs to the white warrior. Revenge is the honor of warfare, and Jacauna loves the friend of Pochi. The great Pichiguara chief upraised his formidable tomahawk. The duel between Irapuã and Martin began. The Christian sword was shivered by the savage's tomahawk. The Tabajara chief advanced upon his unarmed adversary. Iracema hissed like the Boisininga and threw herself between her warrior and the Tabajara. At once the massive weapon trembled in his powerful right hand and his arm fell inanimate by his side. The Pocema of victory sounded. The Pichiguara warriors, headed by Jacauna and Pochi, swept the forest. The Tabajaras snatched as they fled their chief from the hatred and vengeance of the daughter of Araquen, who had the power of conquering him, as the Jandaya prostrates the tallest and strongest palm tree by nibbling the core. The eyes of Iracema, scanning the forest, saw the ground strewed with the bodies of her brethren, and in the distance the remnant of their war party flying in a black cloud of dust. That blood which stained the ground was the same brave blood which now lit up her cheeks with shame. The grief drops moistened her beautiful cheek. Martin withdrew, that he might not embarrass her sorrow. He wished her naked woe to bathe itself in tear floods. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, The Legend of Brazil by José de Lencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Pochi returned from pursuing the foe. His eyes filled with delight when he saw the white warrior safe. The faithful dog followed him closely, still licking from its hairy mouth the tabajara blood of which it had drunk its fill. Its master caressed it, pleased by its courage and devotion. It had saved Martin by guiding so diligently the warriors of Jacauna. The bad spirits of the forest may again separate the white warrior from his Pichiguara brother. The dog will henceforth follow him, so that even from a distance Pochi may hear his call. But the dog is thy companion and faithful friend. It will be Pochi's companion and friend still more when it serves his brother than when it serves him. The white warrior shall call it Japi, and it will be the fleet foot with which from afar they will run to each other. Jacauna gave the signal of departure. The Pichiguara warriors marched from the glad banks of the Herons River, where rose the great Taba of the prairie lords. The sun declined, and again soared in the heavens. The warriors arrived where the sea range fell towards the midlands. Already they had passed that part of the mountain, which, being scant of tree and shorn like the capivara, the people of Tupin had called Ibiapina. Pochi took the Christian where grew a leafy jatoba that overtopped the trees of the serra's highest point when waving before the wind. It seemed to sweep the sky with its immense dome. On this spot, the white warrior's brother was born, said the Pichiguara chief. Martin embraced the enormous trunk. Jatobá, thou that sawest my brother Pochi come into the world, the stranger embraces thee. May the lightning wither thee, O tree of the warrior Pochi, 
when his brother abandons him. Then the chief spoke as follows. Then Jacauna was not yet a warrior. Jatobá, our greatest chief, was leading the Pichiguaras to victory. As soon as the full waters began to run, he marched straight for the Serra. Arriving here, he was sent for the whole Taba, that it might be nearer the enemy to vanquish them again. The same moon which saw their arrival shone upon the hammock in which Sai, his wife, gave him one more warrior of his blood. The moonlight played amongst the leafage of the Jatobá, and the smile upon the lips of the great and wise chief who had taken its name and might. Iracema approached. The turtle dove, feeding in the sands, leaves its mate, who flits restlessly from branch to branch, and coos that the absent one may reply. Thus the forest girl wandered in search of her prop, softly humming a gentle, tender song. Martin received her with his soul in his eyes, and leading his wife on the side of his heart, and his friend on the side of his strength, returned to the ranch of the Pichiguaras. End of chapter 19、Chapter、20 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 The Moon Waxed Rounder Three suns had passed since Martin and Iracema had been in the lands of the Pichiguaras, lords of the banks of the rivers Cabocin and Acarau. The strangers had hung their hammocks in the large cabin of the great Jacauna. The brave chief claimed for himself the pleasure of being the white warrior's host. Pochi abandoned his wigwam that he might accompany his brother of war to the cabin of his brother by blood, and to enjoy every moment that the sea warrior could spare to devote to friendship from the love of Iracema. Darkness had already left the face of the earth, but Martin saw that it had not left the face of his wife since the day of the combat. Sorrow lives in the soul of Iracema. Her wife's gladness can come only from her husband. When thy eyes leave Iracema's, tears fill them. Why weeps the daughter of the Tabajaras? This is the Taba of the Pichiguaras, enemies of her people. The sight of Iracema still sees the schools of her brothers staked round the Caissara. Her ears still listen to the death song of the Tabajara captives. Her hand still touches arms dyed with the blood of her fathers. The bride placed her two hands on the warrior's shoulders and reclined upon his breast. Iracema will suffer all for her warrior and lord. The ata fruit is sweet and pleasant, but when bruised it sours. Thy wife would not that her love sour thy heart she would fill it with the sweetness of honey. Let calm return to the breast of the daughter of the Tabajaras. She shall leave the Taba of her people's foes. The Christian marched straight to the cabin of Jacauna. The great chief was joyful on seeing his guest arrive, but joy soon fled from his warlike brow when Martin said, the white warrior is going to leave thy cabin, great chief. Then there is something wanting to him in the cabin of Jacauna. Thy guest hath wanted nothing. He was happy here, but the voice of his heart sends him to another place. Then leave, and take all that is needful for the journey. May Tupin fortify my brother, and bring him back again to the cabin of Jacauna, that he may celebrate his welcoming. Pochi arrived. Hearing that the sea warrior was going, he said, Thy brother will accompany thee. Will not Pochi's warriors need their chief? Unless my brother desires that they go with Pochi, Jacauna will lead them to victory. The cabin of Pochi will be deserted and sad. 
the heart of the white brave's brother would be still more desert and sad without him. The sea warrior left the banks of the river of the herons and marched towards the land where the sun sets. His wife and friend followed his steps. They went beyond the fertile forest range where the abundant fruits breed a swarm of flies from which it takes the name of Mirwaka. They crossed the little streams which discharged their waters into the river of the herons, and they sighted on the far horizon a high mountain range. The day expired. A black cloud seemed to be advancing from the sea. It was the urubus that feast on the dead which the ocean throws up on the beach and return with the night to their nests. The travelers slept at Uruburetama. When the sun reappeared, it found them on the banks of the river which rises in the Serra Gap and descends winding like a serpent into the plain. Its mazes deceive at every step the pilgrims who follow its tortuous course, for which reason it was called the Mundau. Following its cool banks, Martin, on the second sun, beheld the green seas and the white beaches where the murmuring waves now sob, and then, raging with fury, break in flakes of foam. The eyes of the white warrior dilated at the vast expanse, his chest heaved. The same sea also kissed the white sands of the Potengi, his cradle, where he first saw the light of America. He threw himself into the waves and reveled in the thought that he bathed his body in the waters of his native country and his soul in yearning for it. Iracema felt her heart weep, but soon her warrior's smile reassured her. Meantime, Pochi, from the top of a palm tree, arrowed the savory camorotin which sported in the little bay of Mnau, and prepared the mokin for their refection. End of chapter 20、Chapter、Twenty One of Iracema, the Hunting Lips, the Legend of Brazil, by Jose de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One. The sun had already left the zenith. The travelers reached the mouth of that river where the savory Tahira salmon breeds abundantly and whose banks are peopled by fishermen of the great Pichiguara race. They received the strangers with that generous hospitality which was a law of their religion, and Pochi, with the respect due to so great a warrior and to a brother of Jacauna, the most powerful chief of the Pichiguaras. To rest the travelers and to dismiss them with proper ceremony, the chief of the tribe received Martin, Iracema, and Pochi in the jangada, and spreading a sail to the breeze, bore them far down the coast. All the fishermen in their rafts followed their chief and filled the air with a song of lament, accompanied by the murmurings of the urasa, which imitates the sobbing of the wind. Beyond the fishing tribe and nearer the serras was the hunting tribe. They occupied the borders of the Suipe, covered with forests, where abounded deer, the fat paca, and the slender jacu. Hence, the dwellers of these regions had named it the hunting ground. Jaguarasu, or great tiger, the chief of these hunters, had a wigwam on the banks of the lake formed by the river as it nears the sea. Here, the travelers met with the same warm reception which they had received from the fishermen. After leaving Soipe, the travelers crossed the river Pacochi, on whose borders flourished a leafy banana waving its green plumes. Farther on is the Iguape stream, whose waters encircle the dunes of sand. In the distance, crowning the horizon, appeared a high sand hill. Snowy white as the ocean foam. The summit overhung the palms and cocos, and appeared like the bald head of the condor, there awaiting the storm blowing up 
from the ocean bounds. But she knows the great hill of sand? asked the Christian. But she knows all the land that belongs to the Pichiguaras, from the banks of the great river which forms an arm of the sea, to the banks of the stream where the jaguar lives. He has been already to the height of Mokoribi, and thence he has seen, far at sea, the big Igaras of the white warriors, the enemies of my brother, who dwell in Meari. Why callest thou the great sandhill Mokoribi? The fisherman of the beach, who puts out to sea in Jangadas, there where the Achi flies, is sad, because he is far from his cabin, where sleep the children of his blood. When he returns, and his eyes first behold the hill of sand, gladness returns to the man's breath. Then he says that the hill of the sands gives joy. The fisherman says, well, thy brother, like him, is happy when he sees the mountain of sand. Martin and Pochi ascended the head of Mokoribi. Iracema followed with her eyes her spouse, wandering like the Jassanã round the beautiful bay, which earth formed to receive the sea. On her way, she collected the sweet cajus, which appeased the warrior's thirst, and gathered delicate shells to ornament her neck. The travelers dwelt in Mokoribi three sons. Then Martin directed his steps beyond it. The wife and friend followed him to the bank of a river, whose banks were overflowed and covered with mangrove. The sea entering into it formed a basin of clear, crystalline water, which appeared almost scooped out of the stone like a vase of pottery. While reconnoitering this place, the Christian warrior began to reflect. To the present time, he had marched without any object, and he had allowed his steps to guide him where they would. He had no other thought except to absent himself from the taba of the Pichiguaras, that he might the better soothe the sorrow in Iracema's heart. The Christian knew by experience that travel cures a saudade, because the soul rests whilst the body moves. But now, seated on the beach, he pondered. But she came. The white warrior thinks the breast of his brother is open to receive his thought. But his brother thinks that this is a better place than the margins of Jaguaribi for the taba of the warriors of his race. In these waters, the big igadas that come from the far-off land may lie sheltered from wind and sea. Hence, they can fall upon the Arim and destroy the white tapuyus, the allies of the Tabajaras, enemies of Pochi's nation. The Pichiguara chief reflected and replied, My brother may go and bring his warriors. Pochi will plant his taba close to the mairi of his friend. Iracema drew nigh. The Christian made a gesture of silence to the Pichiguara chief. The voice of the husband is silent, and his eyes fall when Iracema comes. Shall she depart? Thy husband wants thee nearer, that his voice and eyes may penetrate still deeper into thy soul. The beautiful savage was radiant with smiles, as a ripening flower opens its petals, and she leant upon the shoulder of her warrior. Iracema listens to thee. These plains are joyful, and will be more so when Iracema dwells in them. What says her heart? Iracema's heart is ever glad when she is with her lord and warrior. The Christian followed the bank of the river and chose a place for his wigwam. Pochi felled the carnauba to make props of its trunks. The daughter of Araquen weaved, fan-like, the fronds of the palms to thatch the roof and quaff the walls. Martin dug the trenches and made a door of laths and layers of bamboo. When night came, the lovers slung their hammock in their new cabin, and the friend slept in the porch which faced the rising sun. End of chapter 21
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Pochi saluted his friend and spoke as follows. Ere the father of Jacauna and Pochi, the valiant warrior Jatobá, ruled over all the Pichiguara warriors, the great tomahawk of the nation was in the right hand of Batuireté, the head chief, sire of Jatobá. It was he who came along the sea beach to the river of the jaguars, and expelled the tabajadas into the interior, and dictated to each tribe the limits of its lands. Then he entered the inner regions as far as the serra, which takes his name. When his stars were many, so many that his camosim no longer contained all the nuts that marked the number of his years, his body began to incline earthwards. His arms stiffened like the branch of the unbending Ubiratã, and his eyes grew dark. He then called the warrior Jatobá and said, Let my son take the tomahawk of the Pichiguara nation. Tupin wills not that Batuireté should carry it any more to war, since he has taken from him the strength of his body, the use of his arm, and the light of his eyes. But Tupin has been good to him, since he gave him a son like the warrior Jatobá. Jatobá took the tomahawk of the Pichiguaras. Batuireté assumed the staff of his old age and set out. He crossed the vast, uninhabited regions to the luxuriant prairies, where run the waters that come from the quarter of the night. As the old warrior dragged his limbs along their banks, and the light of his eyes would not let him behold, nor the fruits, nor the trees, nor the birds of the air, he said in his sadness, Ha, my bygone days! The people who heard him wept over the ruins of the great chief. And since then, whoever passes by that spot repeats his words, Ha, meus tempos passados! For which reason, the river and the prairie are called Kixeramobim. Batuireté came from the path of the herons as far as that serra which thou seest in the distance, and there he first lived. On the topmost peak, the old warrior made his nest, as high as flies the hawk, to pass the remnant of his days speaking with Tupin. His son already sleeps under the earth, whilst he, even during the last moon, was thinking at his cabin door, to await the night which brings the great sleep. All the Pichiguara warriors, when the voice of war awakes them, visit and beg the old man that he will teach them to conquer, for no other warrior ever knew to fight as he did. Thus the tribes call him no more by his name, but know him as the great wise men of war, Maranguab. The chief Pochi wants to visit the Serra to see his mighty grandsire, but before day falls he will be back in the cabin of his brother. Has he any other wish? The white warrior will accompany his brother. He wants to embrace the great chief of the Pichiguaras, grandfather of Pochi, and to tell the old man that he lives again in his grandson. Martin called Iracema, and they both set out, guided by the Pichiguara to the Serra of Maranguape, which loomed above the horizon. They followed the course of the river to the place where it is joined by the stream of Pirapora. The cabin of the old warrior was close to one of those beautiful cascades where the fish leap in the midst of the bubbling foam. The waters here are fresh and sweet, like the sea breeze in the hour of heat, murmuring amongst the palm leaves. Batuirate was sitting upon one of the cascade rocks. The burning sun rays fell full upon his head, which was bald and wrinkled as the genipapo. Thus sleeps the jaburu at the edge of the tank. Pochi has arrived at the cabin of the great Maranguab, father of Jatobá, and has brought his white brother to see the greatest warrior of the nations. The old man only opened his heavy eyelids and passed a long but feeble look from the grandson to the stranger. Then his chest heaved and his lips murmured, Tupin wills that these eyes should see, before being quenched, the white hawk, side by side with the Narcesia. 
the abayeté dropped his head on his chest and spoke no more nor moved again poti and martin supposing that he slept respectfully withdrew not to disturb the repose of one who had done such deeds during his long life iracema who had bathed in the nearest cachoeira came to meet them bringing combs of the purest honey in the leaf of the taioba the friends wandered about the flourishing environs till the shade of the mountain darkened the valley then they returned to the spot where they had left the maranguabe the old man was still there in the same attitude with his head bent on his chest and his cross knees supporting his forehead the ants were running up his body and the two wings were fluttering around him and settling upon his bald head pochi placed his hand on the old man's head and felt that he was dead he had died of old age the pichiguara chief then intoned the song of death presently he went into the cabin to fetch the camusin which was filled to overflowing with nuts of caju martin counted five times five handfuls meanwhile iracema gathered in the forest the angiroba with which to anoint the body of the old man in the camusin where the dutiful hands of his grandson placed him the funeral vase remained suspended to the cabin roof they then planted the urtiga or large stinging nettle before the doorway to defend against animals the abandoned oca poti made a sorrowful farewell to these scenes and returned with his companions to the borders of the sea end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three. Four moons had lighted the heavens since Iracema had left the plains of Ipu, and three since she had dwelt in the wigwam of her husband by the shore of the sea. Gladness dwelt within her soul. The daughter of the forest was happy as the swallow that abandons its paternal nest and goes forth to build a new home in the land where the flower season begins. Iracema likewise found there on the seashore a nest of love, the heart's new country. She wandered over the beautiful plains like the hummingbird hovering amongst the flowers of the acacia. The light of early morning found her already clinging to the shoulder of her husband, ever smiling, like the enhegissa which twines round the tree trunk and which covers it with a new garland every morning. Martin went out to hunt with Pochi. He then separated himself from her in order to have the pleasure of returning to her. In the middle of a green pasture hard by was a beautiful lake to which the wild girl used to direct her light step. It was the hour of the morning bath. She would cast herself into the water and swim with the white herons and the scarlet jassanunch. The Pichiguara warriors who chanced to come that way called this the Lake of Beauty because it was bathed in by Iracema, the most beautiful of the race of Tupin. And from that time till now, mothers come from afar to dip their daughters in the waters of the Parangaba, which they suppose have the virtue of making the virgins beautiful and beloved by the braves. After the bath, Iracema wandered to the skirt of the Serra of Maranguab, where rises the river of the Marrecas. There, in the cool shade, grew the most savory fruits of the country. She would collect a plentiful supply and rock herself in the branches of the Maracujá tree waiting for Martin to return from hunting. Her fancy did not always, however, lead her to the Gerarahu, but often to the opposite side, close to the lake of the Sapiranga, whose waters are said to inflame the eyes. Near it was a wood, thick and leafy, with clumps of murichis, which formed in the middle of the plateau a large island of beautiful palms. 
Iracema loved the Muriti Apua, where the wind blew softly. Here she stripped the pulp from the red cocoa to make refreshing drinks mixed with the bee honey, which the warriors liked to drink in the great heat of the day. One morning, Pochi guided Martin to the chase. They marched towards a serra which towers on the opposite side to Maranguap, its twin sister. The highest peak bends like the hooked beak of the Macau, and hence the warriors named it Aratanha. They mounted by the side of Guayuba, whence the waters descend into the valley, and they went to the stream where the Pacas are to be found. The sun shone on the Macau's beak only, when the hunters descended from Pacatuba to the plateau. From afar they saw Iracema, who came to wait for them on the margin of her lake, the Porangaba. She came towards them with the proud step of the heron, stalking by the water's edge. Outside her carioba she wore a belt of maniva, the flowers of which are an emblem of fruitfulness. A festoon of the same flowers twined round her throat and fell over her marble bosom. She seized the hand of her husband and carried it to her lips. Thy blood lives in the bosom of Iracema. She will be the mother of thy son. Son, saidst thou? exclaimed the Christian with joy. Kneeling down, he threw his arm around her and kissed her, mutely thanking God for this great happiness. When he arose, Pochi spoke. The happiness of the young brave is a wife and a friend. The first gives gladness, the second gives strength. The warrior without a spouse is like a tree lacking leaves and flowers. Never shall he behold its fruit. The brave without a friend is like the solitary tree, waving in the midst of the prairie, with each blast of wind. Its fruit never ripens. The happiness of the strong man is the offspring which is born to him, and which is his pride. Every warrior of his blood is one branch more to raise up his name to the sky, like the top branch of the setter. Beloved by Tupin is the warrior who has a wife, a friend, and many sons. He has nothing more to desire, save a glorious death. Martin pressed his bosom to that of Pochi. The heart of both husband and friend speaks by the mouth of Pochi. The white warrior is blessed, O chief of the Pichiguaras, lords of the seashores, and happiness was born to him in the land of the palm trees, where the baunilia perfumes the air. It was begotten by the blood of thy race, who bear on their faces the color of the sun's ray. The white warrior no longer desires any other country, save the land of his son and of his heart. At the break of dawn, Pochi set out to gather the seeds of the cajuru, which yields a most beautiful red dye, and the bark of the anjiku, whence is extracted a lustrous black. On the way, his unerring arrow brought down a wild duck sailing in the air, and he took from its wings the longest feathers. He then ascended Mokoribi and sounded the Inubia. The sea breeze carried far the hoarse sound. The shell of the fishermen of the Trairi and the horn of the hunters of the Soipé gave answer. Martin bathed in the river waters and walked on the beach to dry himself in the wind and sun. By his side ran Iracema, collecting the yellow ambergris cast up by the sea. Every night the wife perfumed her body in the white hammock that the love of the warrior might remain captivating. Pochi returned. End of chapter 23《Chapter 24 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 It was customary amongst the race of Dupin for the brave to wear on his body the colors of his nation. They first traced upon the skin black lines, like those of the Quachi, whence came the name of the war-painting art. They also varied the colors, and many warriors were covered with emblems of their deeds. 
the stranger, having adopted the country of his spouse and his friend, was expected to pass through this ceremony, in order to become a redskin warrior and a son of Tupin. With this intention, Pochi had provided for himself the necessary objects. Iracema prepared the dyes. The chief, dipping in them the feathers, traced over the warrior's body the red and black lines, the Pichiguara colors. He then drew on his forehead an arrow, and said, As the arrow pierces the hard trunk, so the warrior's eye penetrates the soul of the people. On the arm, a hawk. As the anagé swoops from the clouds, so falls the warrior's arm upon the enemy. On the left foot, the root of a palm tree. As the little root supports in the ground the lofty palm tree, thus the firm foot of the warrior sustains his frame. On the right foot, a wing. As the wing of the majoi cleaves the air, thus the fleet foot of the warrior has no equal in the race. Irasema then took the feather vein and painted a leaf with a bee upon it. Her voice murmured through her smiles. As the bee makes honey in the black heart of the jacarandá, so sweetness is in the breast of the bravest warrior. Martin opened his arms and lips to receive the body and soul of his wife. My brother is a great warrior of the Pichiguara nation. He wants a name in the language of his new country. The name of thy brother shall be called by whatever part of his body thou imposest thy hand upon. Quachiabu! exclaimed Irasema. Thou hast said it. I am the painted warrior, the warrior of the wife and of the friend. Pochi gave to his brother the bow and the tomahawk, which were the noble arms of a brave. Irasema had prepared for him the plumes and ornamented belt worn by illustrious chiefs. The daughter of Araquen fetched from the cabin the meats of the feast and the wines of the genipapu and mandioca. The warriors drank copiously and danced joyous dances. Whilst they revolved round the bonfires, they sang songs of gladness. Pochi chanted, As the cobra snake, which has two heads and only one body, so is the friendship of Quachiabu and Pochi. Irasema took up the refrain. As the oyster which leaves not the rock until after death, so is Irasema joined to her husband. The warriors chanted. As the jatobá in the forest, so is the warrior Quachiabu between his brother and spouse. His branches entwine with those of Yubiratan, and his shade protects the humble grass. The fires of joy burned until morning came, and with them lasted the feast of the warriors. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Joy still reigned in the cabin during the whole time whilst the ears of corn ripened and waxed yellow. Once at break of day, the Christian was strolling by the borders of the sea. His soul was weary. The hummingbird satiates itself with honey and perfume. It then sleeps in its little white nest of cotton until another year comes round with its moon of flowers. Like it, the warrior's soul is sated with happiness. It wants sleep and repose. Hunting and excursions in the mountains with his friend by his side the tender caresses of the wife awaiting his return, the pleasant carbeto in the wigwam porch, no longer awakened in him emotions as they were wont to do. His heart began to speak. Iracema was sporting on the beach. His eyes wandered from her over the sea's vast expanse. Large white wings were seen hovering over the blue waste, the Christian knew that it was a big igada of many sails, such as were constructed by his brethren, and the saudade of his country wrung his breast. High rose the sun. The warrior on the shore followed with his eyes the white wings as they fled. 
In vain the wife called him to the hut. In vain she displayed to his eyes her graces, or offered him the best fruits of the country. The warrior never moved until the sail disappeared behind the horizon. Pochi returned from the Serra, where, for the first time, he had been alone. He had left serenity on his brother's countenance, and now he found there sorrow. Martin went forth to meet him. The great Igara of the white Tapuya is on the sea. The eyes of Pochi's brother saw them flying towards the banks of the Meari. They are the allies of the Tupinambas, and the enemies of his and my race. Pochi is lord of a thousand bows. If Quachiabu wishes, he will accompany him with his braves to the bank of the Mearim to conquer the Tapuichinga and his friends, the treacherous Tupinambas. When it is time, Pochi's brother will tell him. The warriors returned to the cabin where Irasema was. The sweet song today was silent on the wife's lips. She wove amidst her sighs the fringe of the maternal hammock, broader and thicker than the marriage cot. Pochi, who saw her thus occupied, spoke. When the Sabiá sings, it is the season of love. When, silent, it makes the nest for the little one, it is the time for work. My brother speaks like the wren announcing the rain. But the sabiá which makes its nest does not know if it will sleep in it. The voice of Iracema trembled. Her eyes sought Martin. He was thinking. The words of Iracema passed over him, like the breeze upon the smooth surface of the rocks, noiseless and echoless. The sun still shone on the sea beach, and the sands reflected its ardent rays. But neither the light which came from heaven nor that which earth gave could drive darkness from the Christian soul. Every moment the twilight deepened on his forehead. Arrived from the banks of the Atarau, a Pichiguara warrior, sent by Jacauna to his brother Pochi. He had followed the warrior's trail as far as the Trairi, whence the fisherman had guided him to the wigwam. Pochi was alone in the porch. He rose up and bent his head, to listen with more gravity and respect to the words which his brother had sent him by the mouth of the messenger. The Tapuichinga, who was in the Mearim, came through the forests as far as the beginning of the Ibiapaba, where he had made an alliance with Irapuã to fight the Pichiguara nation. They are coming down the Serra to the banks of the river where the herons drink and where Pochi raised the taba of his warriors. Jacauna now summons him to defend the lands of our fathers, and his people want their greatest warrior. The warrior must return to the banks of Akaraú, and his foot must not rest until it has trodden the floor of Jacauna's wigwam. When he arrives, he will say to the great chief, Jacauna's brother has arrived at the taba of his warriors, and he will not lie. The messenger departed. Pochi aroused himself and walked towards the plains guided by the trail of Quachiabo. He met him far beyond, wandering amongst the reeds and rushes which border the banks of Jacaratui. The white Tapuya is in Libiapaba to help the Tabajaras against Jacauna. Pochi is hastening to defend the land of his brothers, and the Taba where sleep the Camosins of his fathers. He will know how to conquer quickly, in order to return to Quachiabo. Pochi's brother goes with him. Nothing separates two warrior friends when sounds the Inubia of war. My brother is great like the sea, and good like the sky. The two friends embraced, and marched with their faces turned to the quarter of the rising sun. End of chapter 25《Chapter 26 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Chapter 26 Walking, ever walking, the braves arrived at the borders of a lake which was in the plateau land. The Christian suddenly stopped and turned his face towards the sea. 
the sadness left his heart and rose to his forehead. My brother's foot has taken root in the land of love, said the chief. Let him remain. Pochi will quickly return. Pochi's brother will accompany him. He has said it, and his word is like the arrow of Pochi's bow. When it whistles, it has already pierced the mark. Does my brother then wish that Iracema should accompany him to the banks of the Acaraú? We go to fight her brothers. The taba of the Pichiguaras would only be to her a scene of pain and sadness. The daughter of the Tabajaras should remain. What then does Quachabo wait? Pochi's brother is afflicted, because the daughter of the Tabajaras may be sad, and abandon the wigwam without awaiting his return. Before departing, he would wish to soothe the spirit of the wife. Pochi took thought. The tears of woman soften the warrior's heart as the morning dew softens the earth. My brother's wise, the husband must go without seeing Irasema. The Christian advanced. Pochi bid him stop. From the aljava which Irasema had adorned with black and red feathers and had placed on her husband's shoulders, he selected an arrow. The Pichiguara drew the bow. The fleet arrow pierced a guayamu, which was running on the banks of the lake, and stopped only where the feathers would not allow it to enter farther. The warrior thrust the arrow into the ground with the prey transfixed, and turned towards Quachiabo. My brother may now set out contentedly. Irasema will follow his trail. Arriving here, she will see his arrow, and obey his will. Marching smiled and breaking a branch of the maracujá, the flower of remembrance, he twined it round the arrow, and advanced, followed by Pochi. Soon the two warriors disappeared amongst the trees. The heat of the sun had already dried their footsteps on the banks of the lake. Irasema became uneasy, and followed her husband's trail as far as the tableland. Gentle shades already mottled the prairies, when she reached the brink of the lake. Her eyes detected the arrow of her husband thrust into the ground, and the pierced Goyamun with the broken branch, and they filled with tears. He commands Irasema to go backwards like the Goyamun, and to keep his remembrance like the Maracujá, which retains its flower until death. The daughter of the Tabajaras slowly retraced her steps backwards, without turning her body, and never taking her eye off the arrow of her warrior, till she reached the cabin. Here she sat down on the threshold, and bent her forehead on her knees, till sleep soothed the pain in her breast. Hardly had the day broken, when she directed her hasty steps to the lake, and arrived at its bank. The arrow was still there, as it had been the evening before, then he had not returned. From this time till the bath hour, instead of seeking the lake of beauty, where hitherto she had bathed with such pleasure, she came to that which had seen her husband abandon her. She would sit down close to the arrow until night came, and then seek the cabin. She would set out in early morning as hurriedly as she would return slowly in the evening. The same warriors who had seen her so joyous in the waters of Porangaba now met her sad and alone, like the widowed heron on the river banks. Hence, they called the spot of the Mosejana, or of the Forsaken. One day, when the beautiful daughter of Araquen was lamenting on the brink of the Mosejana lake, a strident voice from the top of a Carnauba cried out her name, Iracema! Iracema! Raising her eyes, she saw, amongst the palm fronds, her beautiful Jandaya flapping its wings and ruffling its feathers with the joy of seeing her. The remembrance of her country, extinguished by love, burned again in her thoughts. She saw the beautiful plains of the Ipu, the sides of the mountain range where she was born, and the wigwam of Araquen, and she felt saudades. 
but even at this moment she did not repent of having abandoned them. Her voice gushed forth in song. The jandaya opened its wings, fluttered around, and settled on her shoulder. It stretched its neck and rubbed itself against her throat. It smoothed her hair with its black beak and pecked her small red lips as if it mistook them for a pitanga. Iracema remembered how ungrateful she had been to the jandaya, forgetting it at the time of her happiness, and now it came to console her in her sorrow. This evening she did not return alone to the cabin, and all next day her agile fingers wove a beautiful cage of straw which she lined with the soft wool of the manguba to receive her companion and friend. On the following dawn, the voice of the jandaya awoke her. The beautiful bird left its mistress no more, either because it could never weary of seeing her after so long an absence, or because instinct told it that she needed a companion in her sad solitude. End of chapter 26、Chapter、27 Chapter of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil. By José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Seven. One evening, Iracema saw from afar two warriors advancing on the sea beach. Her heart beat more quickly. An instant afterwards, she forgot, in the arms of her husband, the many days of yearning and desolation which she had passed in the solitary wigwam. Again, her graces and endearments filled the eyes of the Christian, and gladness once more dwelt in his soul. Like the dry plain, which, when the thick fog comes, grows green again and is spangled with flowers, so the beautiful daughter of the forest revived at the return of her husband, and her beauty was adorned with soft and tender smiles. Martin and his brother had arrived at the Taba of Jacauna as the Inubia was sounding. They led Pochi's thousand bowmen to the combat. Again, the Tabajaras, in spite of the alliance with the white Tapuias of the Mearim, were overcome by the brave Pichiguaras. Never had such an obstinate fight been fought, nor had so disputed a victory been won. On the plains watered by the Acaraú and the Camusim. The valor was equal on both sides, and neither nation would have been victor had not the god of war already decided to give these shores to the race of the white warrior allied to the Pichiguaras. Immediately after triumphing, the Christian returned to the sea beach where he had built his wigwam. He felt anew in his soul. The thirst of love, and he trembled to think that Iracema might have deserted the place which had formerly been peopled by happiness. The Christian loved the daughter of the forest once more, as at first, when it appeared that time could not exhaust his heart. But a few short suns sufficed to wither these flowers of a heart exiled from its country. The imbu, son of the mountains, if it spring up in the plains where the wind or the birds have borne its seed, finding good and fresh ground, may perhaps one day dome itself with green foliage and bear flowers. But a single breath of the sea suffices to wither it. The leaves strew the ground, the blossoms are carried away by the breeze. Like the imbu on the plains. Was the heart of the white warrior in the savage land? Friendship and love had accompanied him and sustained him for a time. Now, however, far from his home and his people, he felt himself in a desert. The friend and the wife did not suffice any longer to his existence. Full of great and noble projects of ambition, he passed the suns once so short, now so long, on the beach. Listening to the moaning of the wind and the sobbing of the waves, his eyes, lost in the immensity of the horizon, 
sought, but in vain, to spy upon the transparent blue the whiteness of a sail wandering over the seas. At a short distance from the cabin, at the edge of the ocean, was a dune of sand. The fishermen called it Jacarecanga, on account of its resemblance to a crocodile's head. From the bosom of the white sands, scorched by the ardent sun, flowed the pure fresh water. Thus, pain distills sweet tears of relief and consolation. To this hill, the Christian would repair, and remain there, meditating upon his destiny. Sometimes, the idea of returning to his own country and people would cross his mind, but he knew that Iracema would accompany him, and this thought gnawed his heart. Each step that took Iracema farther from her native plains, now that she no longer could nestle in his heart, was to rob her of a portion of her life. Pochi knows that Martin desires to be alone, and discreetly withdraws. The warrior knows what afflicts his brother's soul, and hopes all things from time, which alone hardens the warrior's heart, like the core of the jacaranda. Iracema also avoids the eyes of her husband, because she already perceives that those eyes, so much loved, are troubled at her sight, and instead of filling with delight at her beauty, as formerly, now seem to turn wearily away. But her eyes never tire of following apart, and at a distance, her lord and warrior, who had made them captive. Woe to her! The blow had struck home to her heart, and, like the Copaiba, wounded in the core, she shed tears in one continuous stream. End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of Iracema, The Honey Lips, The Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Once, the sobs of Iracema reached the Christian soul. His eyes sought her all around and could not find her. The daughter of Araquim was sitting at some distance upon the turfy grass in the midst of a green clump of ubayas. Weeping veiled her beautiful face, and the tear-drops that rolled down her cheeks one after another fell upon her bosom where the offspring of love already breathed and grew. Thus fall the leaves of the flourishing tree before the ripening of the fruit. What wrings tears from the heart of Iracema? Cajueiro weeps and is sad when it becomes a dry trunk. Iracema lost her happiness when her lord separated from her. Am I not near thee? The body of Huachiaba is here, but his soul flies to the land of his fathers and seeks the white virgin who awaits him. Martin was grieved. The large black eyes that the Indian fixed on him pierced him to the heart's core. The white warrior's thy husband. He belongs to thee. The beautiful Tabajara smiled in her soil. How long is it that he has withdrawn his spirit from Iracema? Once his feet guided him to the cool serras and the glad tablelands. His foot loved to tread the land of happiness and to follow the steps of his wife. Now he seeks along the scorching sands because the sea which murmurs there comes from the plains where he was born, and the hill of sand, because from its top he can descry the passing Igara. It is his anxiety to fight the Tupinambá, which guides the warrior's step to the borders of the sea, said the Christian. Iracema continued, His lip has dried towards his wife, as the sugar cane when the great suns burn. It then loses its sweet honey, and the withered leaves play never more in the wind. Now he only speaks to the sea beach breeze, that it may carry back his voice to the cabin of his fathers. 
the voice of the white warrior, is only calling his brothers to defend the cabin of Iracema and the land of his son when the enemy shall come. The wife shook her head. When Quachiabo walks in the plains, his eyes avoid the fruit of the genipapa and seeks the white thorn. Its fruit is savory, but it has the color of the tabajaras. The thorn bears a white flower, like the cheeks of the pale virgin. If the bird sings, his ear no longer cares to listen to the sweet song of the grauna. But he opens his soul to the cry of the japin, because it has golden feathers, like the hair of her whom he loves. Sorrow dims the sight of Iracema, and embitters her lip. But gladness will soon return to the wife's soul, as the green leaves bud again on the tree. When the white warrior's son has left the bosom of Iracema, she will die, like the abachi after it has yielded its fruit. Then he will have nothing to detain him in a foreign land. Thy voice burns, daughter of Arakain, like the winds which blow in the great heat from the deserts of Iko. Wouldst thou abandon thy husband? Does the white warrior see that beautiful jacarandá which rises to the clouds? At its feet still lies the dry root of the leafy myrtle, which every winter bears foliage and red berries to embrace and cover its brother tree. If it did not die, the jacarandá would not have sun enough to reach that height. Iracema is the foliscura, which creates darkness in Quachiago's soul. She must fall, that gladness may shine within his breast. The Christian threw his arms round the waist of the beautiful Indian, and strained her to his heart. His lips sought hers in a kiss, but it was harsh and bitter. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Iracema, The Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 Pochi returned from the bath. He follows the trail of Quachiabo in the sand and ascends the height of Jacarecanga. Here he finds the warrior on the summit, standing upright with his eyes straining and his arms stretched towards the broad seas. The Pichiguara follows his gaze and discovers a large igara ploughing the green waters and driven on by the wind. It is the great igara of my brother's nation sent to seek him. The Christian sighed. They are the white warriors, enemies of his race, who seek, for a war of vengeance, the shores of the brave Pichiguara nation. They were routed with the Tabajaras on the banks of the Camosim. Now they come with their friends, the Tupinambas, by the way of the sea. My brother is a great chief. What thinks he that his brother Pochi should do? Summon the hunters of the Soipé and the fishers of the Trairi. We will hasten to encounter them. Pochi awoke the voice of the Inubia, and the two warriors set out for Mokoribi. Soon they saw, hastening from all parts, the braves of Jaguarassu and Camoropim, to respond to the war cry. The brother of Jacauna warned them of the enemy's approach. The great Maracatim flew upon the waters along the coast, which extends as far as the margins of the Parnaíba. The moon began to increase. When the ship left the waters of the Mearim, contrary winds drove it into the high seas, far beyond its destination. The Pichiguara warriors, in order not to startle the enemy, hide themselves among the cajueiros and follow the great Igara along the shore. During the day, the white sails are conspicuous, and by night the ship's lights pierce the sea's darkness like fireflies lost in the forest. Many suns they march thus. They pass beyond the Camosí, and at last they tread the beautiful shores of the Bay of Parrots. Pochi sends a warrior to the great Jacauna and prepares for the combat. Martin, who had mounted the hill of sand, knew that the Maracatim would seek shelter under the lee of the land 
and warns his brother. The sun was already rising. The Guaraciaba warriors and their friends, the Tupinambas, run along the waves in light pirogas to make the shore. They form a great arc, like a shoal of fish crossing the current of a river. In the middle are the fire warriors, who carry the lightning. On each wing, the warriors of Mearim, who brandish the tomahawk. But no nation ever drew the bow so unerringly as the great Pichiguaras. And Pochi was the greatest chief of all the chiefs who carried the Nubia of war. At his side marches his brother, as great a chief as himself, and learned in the stratagems of the white race with hair like the sun. During the night, the Pichiguaras had, by his directions, fixed into the beach a strong caissara, or stockade of thorns, and had raised against it a wall of sand, where the lightning might cool and extinguish itself. Here they await the foe. Martin orders other warriors to man the tops of the highest palms, and there, screened by the broad fronds, to make ready for the moment of attack. The arrow of Pochi was the first which left the beach, and the Guaraciaba chief was the first hero that bit the dust upon the strange soil. The thunders roar from the right of the white warriors, but the bolts only burrow themselves in the sand or dive into the sea. The Pichiguara arrows now fall from the heavens, then they fly from the earth and bury themselves in the enemy's hearts. Each warrior falls, riddled with many arrows, like the prey for which the piranhas fight in the waters of the lake. The enemy once more embark in the canoes and return to the Maracatim to fetch bigger and heavier thunders which neither one man nor two could manage. When they were returning, the chief of the fishers, who swims in the sea waters like the agile Camoropin, from whom he took his name, casts himself into the waves and dives. Before the foam had passed away from the place where he disappeared, the enemy's canoe had sunk, as if it had been swallowed by a whale. The night came, and brought with it repose. At dawn of day, the Maracatim was flying in the horizon, towards the banks of the Mearim. Jacauna arrived, not in time for the fight, but for the feast of victory. At the same hour that the songs of the Pichiguara warriors were celebrating the conquest of the Guaraciabas, the first son born to this land of liberty, begotten by the blood of the white race, saw the light in the plains of Porangaba. End of chapter 29、Chapter 30 of Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Iracema thought that her bosom would burst. She sought the banks of the river where grows the coqueiro palm and clasped the trunk of the tree till a tiny cry inundated her whole being with joy. The young mother, proud of so much happiness, took the tender one in her arms and with him cast herself into the limpid waters of the river. Then she gave him the delicate breast. And her eyes devoured him with sorrow and love. Thou art Moacir, the fruit of my anguish. The Jandaya, perched at the top of the palm tree, repeated, Moacir. And from that time, the friendly bird united in its song the names of both mother and son. The innocent slept. Iracema sighed. The Jachi makes honey. In the sweet smelling trunk of the sassafrax. During the month of flowers, it flies from branch to branch, collecting the juice to fill the comb, but it does not taste its sweetness reward, because the irara devours in one night the whole swarm. Thy mother also, child of my sorrow, will never taste the joy of seeing the smile on thy lips. 
the young mother fastened over her shoulders a broad swath of soft cotton, which she had made to carry her child always fastened upon her hip. She then followed over the sands the trail of her spouse, who had been gone three sons. She walked gently, not to awake the little one that slept like a bird under the maternal wing. When she arrived at the great hill of sand, she saw that the trail of Martin and Pochi continued along the beach, and guessed that they were gone to the war. Her heart sighed, but her eyes sought the face of her babe. She turned her face back towards the Mukwaribi. Thou art the hill of gladness, but for Irasema thou bringest nothing but sorrow. Returning, the mother placed the still sleeping child in his father's hammock, widowed and solitary, in the cabin center. She lay down upon the mat where she had slept since the time her husband's arms had ceased opening to receive her. The morning light entered the cabin. Irasema saw the shade of a warrior come in with it. Kaubi was standing in the doorway. The wife of Martin sprang up with one bound to protect her child. Her brother raised his sad eyes from the hammock to her face, and spoke with a still sadder voice. It was not vengeance which drew the warrior Kaubi to the plains of the Tabajaras. He has already forgiven. It was a longing to see Irasema, who took away with her all his gladness. Then welcome be the warrior Kaubi to the cabin of his brother, said the wife, embracing him. The fruit of thy bosom sleeps in this hammock, and the eyes of Kaubi long to behold it. Irasema opened the fringe of feathers, and showed the babe's fair face. Kaubi contemplated it for some time, and then laughing, said, He has sucked the soul of my sister. And he kissed in the mother's eyes the image of the child fearing lest his touch might hurt him. The trembling voice of the girl cried, Does Araken still live upon the earth? Hardly. Since my sister left him, his head bent upon his bosom, and it rose up no more. Tell him that Irasema is already dead, that he may be consoled. Kaubi's sister prepared food for the warrior, and slung in the porch the hammock of hospitality, that he might repose after the fatigues of the journey. When the traveller was refreshed, he arose with these words. Say, where is Irasema's husband and Kaubi's brother, that the braves may exchange the embrace of friendship? The sighing lips of the unhappy wife moved like the petals of the cactus flower, stirred by a breeze, and remained speechless. But tears rolled from her eyes in big drops. Kaubi's face clouded. Irasema's brother thought that sadness remained in the plains she had abandoned, because she took with her all the smiles of those who loved her. Irasema dried her eyes. The husband of Irasema has left with the warrior Pochi for the shores of the Akarau. Before three suns shall have illuminated the earth, he will return, and with him gladness to the soul of the wife. The warrior Kaubi awaits him, to know what he has done with the smile which lived on Irasema's lips. The voice of the Tabajara grew hoarse, and his restless step walked at random up and down the cabin. End of chapter 30。Chapter 31 of Irasema, Lips, A Legend of Brazil by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 Softly sang Irasema, rocking the hammock to soothe her son. The beach sands cracked beneath the strong, firm foot of the Tabajara brave, who came from the sea border with an abundance of fish. The young mother crossed the fringes of the hammock that the flies might not tease her sleeping babe and went forth to meet her brother. Kaubi will return to the mountains of the Tabajaras, she said gently. The warrior's brow clouded over. 
And Asima sends away her brother from her wigwam, that he may not see the sorrow that fills it. Araquim had many sons in his youth. Some were carried off by war, and they died like braves. Others chose wives, and begot in their turn numerous offspring. Araquim had but two children of his old age. Iracema is for him like the dove which the hunter has stolen from its nest. Alone remains with the old pajé, the warrior Calbi, to sustain his bent frame and to guide his tremulous steps. Calbi will depart when a shade shall leave the face of Iracema. As lives the night star, so lives Iracema in her sorrow. Only the eyes of her husband can banish the darkness from her brow. Go, in order that his sight may not wax dim at the sight of Calbi. Iracema's brother will depart to please her, but he will return every time the casuated flowers to feel in his heart the child of her bosom. He entered the cabin. Iracema took the child from the hammock, and both mother and son remained pressed to the heart of Calbi. He then passed through the door and soon disappeared amid the trees. Iracema, dragging along her trembling steps, accompanied him for some distance, till he was lost to sight on the skirts of the forest. Then she stopped, when the cry of the jandaya, accompanied by the infant's wail, recalled her to the cabin. Only the cold tent upon which she had sat kept the secret of the tears which it had drank. The young mother gave her child a breast, but the babe's moan was not hushed. The scanty milk refused to flow. The blood of the unhappy girl had been thinned by the ever-flowing tears of which her eyes had not wearied, and none came to her bosom where the first nourishment of life is formed. She dissolved the white kalima and prepared over the fire the mingau to nourish her son. When the sun gilded the mountain crests, she set out towards the forest, carrying on her bosom the sleeping child. In the thickness of the wood was found a lair of the absent Irara. The pups, so small, were whining and rolling over one another. The beautiful Tabajara crept softly up to it. She made for her child a cradle of a soft bough of the maracujá, and sat down near it. She took one by one into her lap, all the pups of the Irara, and abandoned to their famished mouths her bosom, beautiful as the red pitanga, which she had anointed with the honey of the bee. The hungry young ones fastened upon it and greedily drained her breasts. Iracema felt pain, hitherto unknown to her. They seemed to exhaust her life. At last, however, her bosom began to swell, and the milk still tinged with the life fluid of which it is formed, gushed forth. The happy mother cast away the little Iraras, and full of joy, appeased the hunger of the babe. He is now doubly Moasir, son of pain, once born of Iracema, and secondly nourished by her. The daughter of Araquim, at last, began to feel that her veins were drying up, and with all her life, embittered by sorrow, rejected the nourishment which might have restored her strength. Tears and sighs had alike banished the smile and the appetite from her beautiful mouth. End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of Iracema, The Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 The Sun Declines Japi springs out of the forest and runs towards the wigwam door. Iracema, sitting with her child upon her bosom, basks in the sun's ray, for she feels the cold shivering through her frame. On seeing the faithful messenger of her husband, hope revived in her heart. She would have arisen to meet her lord and warrior, but her weak limbs refused to obey her will. She fell helpless against the wigwam prop. 
Japi licked the inanimate hand and jumped playfully to make the child laugh with little barks of joy. Times it rushed to the forest skirts and barked to call its master, and then it ran back to the cabin to fondle the mother and the child. At this time, Martin was treading the yellow prairies of Tawapé. His inseparable brother, Pochi, marched by his side. Eight moons had sped since he had left the beach of Jacarecanga. After conquering the Guaraciabas in the Bay of the Parrots, the Christian warrior left for the banks of the Meari, where lived the savage allies of the Tupinambash. Pochi and his warriors accompanied him. After they had crossed the flowing arm of the sea, which comes from the Serra of Tawachinga and bathes the plains where men fish for Piau, they finally saw the beaches of the Mearim and the Velha Taba of the barbarous Tapuia. The race of the sunny hair gained more and more the friendship of the Tupinambash. The number of the white warriors increased, and they had already raised in the island the great Itaoka to send forth their lightning. When Martin had seen what was wanted, he retraced his way to the prairies of the Porangaba, which he now treads. Already he hears the hoarse grating of the tide on the beach of the Mokoribi. Already the breath of the ocean wave fans his cheek. The nearer his step approaches the wigwam, the slower and more heavy it becomes. He dreads to arrive. He feels that his soul is about to suffer when the sad, heart-weary eyes of his wife shall pierce it. Long ago had speech deserted his parched lip. The friend respects this silence, which he well understands. It is the stillness of the waters running over the dark, deep places. As soon as the two warriors reached the river banks, they heard the barking of the dog calling them and the cry of the Jandaya in lamentation. They were now very near the wigwam, which was hid only by a slip of forest. The Christian stopped, pressing his hand to his bosom to still his heart, which beat like the Poraki, the bark of Japis of gladness, quoth chief, because he has arrived, but the voice of the Jandaya is of sadness. Will the absent warrior find peace in the bosom of the deserted wife? Or will Saudade have killed the fruit of her love? The Christian moved forward his dilatory step. Suddenly, between the branches of the trees, his eyes beheld, sitting at the wigwam door, Irasema, with her boy in her lap, and the dog playing about them. His heart carried him there with a bound, and his whole soul rushed to his lips. Irasema, the broken-hearted wife and mother, could only open her eyes on hearing the beloved voice. Only with a great effort she can raise the babe in her arms and present it to the father who gazes at it with ecstatic love. Receive the son of thy blood. Thou hast arrived in time. Already my breasts have no nourishment for him. Placing the child in the paternal arms, the unhappy mother fainted away like the jichica with its uprooted bulb. The husband then saw how pain and sorrow had withered her form. But beauty still dwelt there, like perfume in the fallen flower of the manaka. Irasema rose no more from the hammock where the afflicted arms of Martin had placed her. The husband, whose love was born anew with paternal joy, surrounded her with caresses which filled her soul with its former happiness but they could not bring her back to life. The stamen of her flower was broken forever. Let the body of thy wife sleep at the foot of the palm tree which thou lovest, and the breeze of the sea shall sigh amongst its leaves. Rasema will think it is thy voice whispering through her hair. Her lip became silent forever. The last spark faded away from the darkening eyes. Pochi supported his brother in his great sorrow. Martin felt how precious in misfortune is a true friend. He is like the hill which shelters from the hurricane, 
the trunk of the strong, hardy ubiratã, pierced by the copim. The camocim received the corpse of Iracema, which, steeped in aromatic spices and sweet herbs, was buried at the foot of the palm tree on the river banks. Martin broke a branch of myrtle, the leaf of sadness, and laid it on the last resting place of his wife. The jandaya, perched at the top of the palm tree, sadly repeated, Iracema. From that time, the Pichiguara warriors, who passed by the deserted wigwam, and who heard the plaintive voice of the devoted bird incessantly calling for its mistress, withdrew with their souls full of sadness from the palm tree where sang the jandaya. And thus it happened, that one day, the river where the palm tree grew, and the prairies through which the river winds, came to be called Seara. End of chapter 32、Iracema, the Honey Lips, a Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 The Cajueiro flowered four times, since Martin had left the shores of Ceará, bearing with him in the fragile bark his little son and the faithful dog. The Jandaya would not leave the land where rested its friend and mistress. The first Cearense, still in his cradle, thus became an emigrant from his fatherland. Did this announce the destinies of the race to be? Poti, with his warriors, awaited on the river banks. The Christian had promised to return. Every morning he climbed the sand hill and strained his eyes, hoping for a friendly sail to whiten the sea horizon. Martin at last returned to the land which had once seen his happiness, and which now sees his bitter regret. When his foot pressed the hot white sand, there spread through his frame a fire which burned his heart. It was the fire of consuming memory. The flame was extinguished only when he stood on the place where his wife slept, because at that moment his heart overflowed like the trunk of the jetai in the great heats and refreshed his grief with a shower of tears. Many warriors of his race accompanied the white chief to found with him the Christian Maidi. There came also a priest of his faith, black robed, to plant the cross upon this savage soil. Pochi was the first who knelt at the foot of the sacred wood. He would not allow anything again to part himself and his white brother. For this reason, as they had but one heart, he wished that both might have the same God. He received in baptism the name of the saint whose day it was, and of the king he was about to serve. Besides these two, his own, translated into the tongue of his new brethren. His fame increased, and it is still the pride of the land in which he first saw the light. The Mairi, which Martin founded on the river banks within the shores of Ceará, flourished. The word of the true God. Budded in the savage land, and the holy church bells re echoed through the valleys where once bellowed the Maracá. Jacauna came to inhabit the plains of the Porangaba to be near his white friend. Camarão, Pochi, placed the taba of his warriors on the banks of the Mosejana. Later, when Albuquerque, the great chief of the white warriors, arrived, Martin and Camarão made for the banks of the Mearim. To chastise the ferocious Tupinambá and to expel the white Tapuya. The husband of Iracema never could behold, without the deepest emotion, the shores where he had been so happy, and the green leaves under whose shade slept the beautiful Tabajara girl. Often he would go and sit upon these soft sands to meditate and to soothe the bitter saudade in his heart. The Jandayas still sang upon the crests of the palm tree, but no more remembered the sweet name of Iracema. On this earth, all things pass away. End of chapter 33
End of Iracema, The Honey Lips, A Legend of Brazil, by José de Alencar, translated by Isabel Burton.